Well, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to Gazelle's first ever uh, webinar in our uh, training series. Uh, we're really excited to be doing this. This is something we've been wanting to do for a long time. Um, and I know many of you have been asking for it. So we're, we're pretty excited to be uh, getting this up and going. Um, this is the, the first one that we're doing tonight. So we're going to get go ahead and get started here. Um, uh, I am Luke Ayersman. I am the CTO and software engineer here at uh, Gazelle. And we've also got Nathan here uh, Hello. with us. Hi. So Nathan uh, also is a software engineer here with me. He's um, my brother. Um, and so we're fortunate to be able to work together here on Gazelle. So uh, we're excited to be doing this uh, webinar here tonight. So we've talked for years about doing a, a user conference uh, at, at Gazelle um, to uh, have a day where everybody comes together and do teaching and training. Um, nothing like that has ever materialized. Um, it would end up being pretty expensive for, for you all to fly somewhere and, and to get trained. And so we've opted to do webinars for now. Uh, we may do a user conference at some point. Um, but uh, for now, this seems like a good stopgap measure. And uh, we're excited to be doing this here tonight. Um, just a couple of procedural matters. Um, we're hoping this is participatory, so feel free to jump in with questions. Um, down at the bottom, you should see some buttons. Um, there should be a button called raise your hand. Um, if you do that, um, we have the ability to let you talk. We can unmute your microphone if you raise your hand and, and give us permission to do that. And so if you want to ask a question, go ahead and raise your hand. If you have a microphone on your computer, we can uh, give you the ability to talk and um, and we'll broadcast it here. If you're not comfortable with doing that, or if you don't have a microphone, you can type a question in the Q&A button down at the bottom, and um, Nathan will moderate those, and he will ask it um, on your behalf. So feel free to do that. Feel free to interrupt us as we go. This is going to be pretty informal here tonight, and um, we'll also have a section at the end for Q&A, um, but feel free to ask questions as we go if you want to see something specific. All right, so let's talk about, so the topic tonight is scheduling, um, how scheduling specifically works in Gazelle. And we're gonna do a deep dive into it. Um, so there's, there's several different topics, but let me just talk at a very high level um, about how scheduling works. Now, a lot of this, uh, a lot of you are coming from very different um, backgrounds. Uh, some of you have been with Gazelle for a long time. Some of you are brand new. Um, so uh, some of this stuff will be um, uh, pretty, um, uh, will be review for many of you, uh, but there will be some uh, behind the scenes, pretty technical stuff that we're going to talk about how things work behind the scenes that you might be interested in as well. So I think there's going to be um, pieces of this that will interest everybody. Um, so feel free to um, ask questions and, and stick around for all of that. So how does scheduling work in Gazelle in general? Um, scheduling is one of the very core features that we have in Gazelle. We designed it very early on and we wanted it to be more than something that you get from uh, most other schedulers. Um, there's, um, there, there's something really unique about the way Gazelle integrates with the rest of the system that makes it a really unique product. So it's hooked into our reminder system. So you know, an, e an email goes out to a customer, they click on a link, it goes to our scheduler. Um, the scheduler then, once they make a reservation, you approve the appointment, it goes on your calendar, that updates the reminder system. All of Gazelle is a system that's designed to work together. Scheduling is just one piece of that. Um, but I mentioned that to say that it is a, a small piece of the larger whole. And we've designed all of these features to work together. Um, so one of the benefits of, of Gazelle's scheduling system is that your customers can schedule their own appointments online if you enable them to. Um, and we're gonna go through some of that today. Um, and when they do that, you can have the confidence that they are only going to schedule options that are good for you, that are, that are um, uh, to your benefit. They're not gonna have you bouncing all across the county. We put a lot of stuff into place. And I'm hoping that at the end of this webinar, you'll realize all that goes into it to make this decision of what appointment, what appointment slots are offered to your customers so that you have a lot more confidence in the way that our scheduling system works. Um, also, you can schedule appointments yourself um, as the technician or as the business owner. Um, and we give you a different interface that you can use for that. And we're gonna go through that as well, both on your mobile phone and on your desktop computer in your, in your web browser. Um, so Gazelle's scheduling system is a lot more complex than just looking at your calendar and picking a time slot. 
And you're going to see that here tonight. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes to make it work, um, to make it work as well as it does. We calculate drive times, including traffic, um, from the appointment that you're trying to schedule to all the other appointments on your calendar so that we can optimize the drive times of your each individual day um, so that you have minimal drive times. And we also work with multiple mapping providers. Um, so we're not just limited to a single provider. So we use Google Maps, we use Azure Maps, we use TomTom Tom for different bits and pieces, depending on your location, depending on what country you're in, um, depending on what piece of Gazelle you're using, we might pull mapping, soft, mapping solutions from different providers. All of this to provide the best possible solution um, to you. Um, all right, so let me go through what we're gonna talk about tonight. Uh, there's six main uh, topics that we're gonna do. Um, first, we're gonna go through a walkthrough of how scheduling works um, from, from what you would see as the technician. Uh, we're gonna go through um, scheduling it from your web browser on your desktop computer. We're gonna go through scheduling on your mobile app. And then also we're gonna go through what your client sees when they self-schedule online. Um, then we're gonna go through two sections here um, about configuration. We're gonna go through all of the options that you have of how you can tweak and configure Gazelle's scheduling, uh, both for your availability and also for the policies that are available. Um, and then fourth, we're gonna show a little sneak peek behind the scenes of how Gazelle works about how we choose the time slots that we do. Um, and, and our goal here is so that you have more confidence in the way that Gazelle works behind the scenes so that you can know that we're offering the best options available. Um, and then fifth, we're gonna go through some best practices some tips that you can use when you're scheduling to make the most of Gazelle. And then finally, we're gonna open it up to more questions. And again, feel free to ask questions throughout the whole webinar um, as well. Just raise your hand or um, down at the bottom, there's a Q&A button. Um, you can ask questions there. Okay, so let's dive into um, to this, some of the scheduling demos. Um, so this is gonna be a little bit informal. If you've done some of the other webinars, um, this is probably gonna be a little bit less formal than that. So I'm gonna jump out of my live demo here, or out of the presentation, I'm gonna jump over to a live demo. All right, oh, and I should also mention, um, the video of me should be up here in the corner, I guess where I'm pointing, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Um, <laughs> uh, the video of me is gonna be up in the top right corner, I believe, if that gets in the way, I think you can click on it and drag it to move it around. Um, so I've also moved my window over a little bit to the left. Um, so hopefully it doesn't get in the way, but I think you should be able to move it if you need to. Okay, so first let's go through how scheduling works on your desktop computer. So let's say you're at home um, and you log into Gazelle, uh, go to uh, gazelleapp.io and log in. Um, click on the calendar over here. And this is a demo calendar uh, showing some demo data that we've got. And there's a couple of different ways that you can schedule in here. Uh, we're gonna show the, um, the smart scheduling first using Gazelle's routes. So you can click on this button up here in the top left corner, this little plus icon, or as a trick, we've also got a bunch of keyboard shortcuts. If you click on this, you can see all of our keyboard shortcuts. You can hit N for a new event when you're on the keyboard. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. That pulls in this screen that lets you choose what type in it of an event. Um, but actually, let me cancel out of this and let me show you another trick. If you hold shift in, it pulls in the scheduler itself. So if you need to schedule an appointment, which is probably the most common thing that you're going to do, the most common type of event that you're going to create, you can, when you're on the calendar, you can just hit shift in and it will pull in the scheduler. Okay, so first thing, um, there's two options here. You can search for a client. So this would be an existing client or you can create a new client. So let me go ahead and search for an existing client. We have a couple of test clients set up here. Um, I'll pull this guy in and it pulls in his address, his phone number, his email address. And, oh, actually I was gonna annotate this so you can see my cursor better. Hold on just a second. And yeah, so we were trying earlier today, the mouse cursor is a little bit small, uh, so. Is that working? Can you see the, um, yep. the red dot? Okay. Hopefully that helps you be able to see where my mouse cursor is a little bit better. Um, so it pulls in this client, their address, and we pull it in on a map so that you can just verify it. It's a little bit of a visual indicator there. Um, if you wanted to do a new client, um, you can reset this and I can click on new client. So if you're on the phone with them, you can just gather some basic information. Um, 
Let's say it's Julia Roberts and ask for the phone number. Uh, oops. Um, do an email and an address. Um, okay, and again, we, we show that on a map here so that you can uh, verify and then click OK. So this will then create this new client when we save this appointment. Uh, another little uh, advanced trick here, if you're on the phone with them and for whatever reason they don't end up scheduling, you can just click save and close here. It will save the client record without um, actually creating the appointment. So if you wanna keep that information that you've already entered, um, just hit save and close if you don't end up going through the whole process here. Okay. So what we do first is we create an unknown piano because we don't know anything about this, this new client. If this was an existing client, we would pull in their existing pianos here. Um, but I can change all of this information. Uh, I could, so let's say you're talking to them and you know it's a Steinway. And that's all the information that you get. That's fine. Everything here is optional. Um, and then you go down here and you ask what services that they want to provide. We pull in um, your default services from your master service list. Now we're gonna have a, another webinar in the future talking about the master service list and how to configure all of that. Um, so I'm not gonna go into those details right now, um, but just know that you can configure all of these services and you can mark some of them as being default. And when you mark them as default, they will get pulled in here automatically for new appointments. Um, or if that's not the one that you want, I could trash that one and pull in a new one here. Let's say that it's a, a full service um, and hit okay. So Gazelle, Gazelle now knows that this is gonna be a two hour time slot and we need, we're looking for a two hour time slot. Now, um, if you have multiple technicians for your company, you will see this third section down here. If you don't, if you're, if you're a, a solo technician, um, you won't even see this option down here. Um, but if you have multiple, you could choose which particular um, technician it's for or you could search for any technician. So I'm gonna just search for Tim here. And I click search my calendar. Um, actually, you know what, before I do that, let me go back. Um, there's another advanced option here. If you click on this little up arrow, this lets you choose a target date. So by default, if you just click search my calendar, it's going to search for the earliest available. Um, if you click this little up arrow, if you have somebody that's pre-booking an appointment, you could search for six months from now or 12 months from now, or just go through the calendar and select a specific date in the future. Um, and Gazelle will search around that date, not just on that particular date. We're gonna go into that in a little bit more detail later, but we're just searching for kind of a target of around where we're looking for. So let's go ahead and search for the earliest available and search my calendar. Okay, so now we show this and these are the options that we've found. Um, we found, it looks like we found 24 options down here, you can see. And we've shown you the top six. The ones in green are the ones that are the best, that we think are the best options for you uh, based on many different criteria. Um, mostly uh, it means that we've, uh, it's the best drive time or it's the best um, uh, availability that you have. Um, so you can look at these options and say which one, see which one is available for your customers. Um, so if you're on the phone with them, just say, does, does Wednesday, September 25th at 2.40 work for you? Now, uh, here's another little advanced trick. If you hit shift and click on one of these options, it will pull up a little bit more detail. Um, it shows you the, the full itinerary for that day, along with this appointment of where it fits into, the, uh, fits into the mix. And you can see a little bit more detail about your drive times for that day, um, just in case you're curious. And then there's these little bubbles up here as well um, that show uh, some warnings. So this means that uh, some driving directions couldn't be found for whatever reason, or there might be traffic uh, if, if there's significant traffic, we would put a little bubble up there that you could see. Um, uh, so that, that just give you a little bit more information there. And if none of these work, you can click on show more and we'll show you another option, another six more options. Um, but let's just say, we, let's choose this first one here. And now it takes us to this final step where um, everything's filled in for you. If everything works great, just go ahead and click save. We'll send an email to the customer. Um, if you need to make a couple of tweaks or make some more notes, um, you could do that here. Um, you could technically adjust the, the date and time. Um, we don't recommend that because Gazelle has searched for the specific date and time um, and it's fitted into your schedule uh, for a very specific reason. If you adjust that, you might have some overlap between appointments or you might 
um, not be able to make your next appointment based on drive time. So uh, if you adjust it here, there, there might be driving conflicts or, or things like that. Um, but this is a way to um, kind of glance over this just to make sure that everything is correct. Um, and then once you do, you hit save and it will go onto your calendar. I'm not going to do that here because I don't want to mess up the demo data. Um, there is also this option down here to send a confirmation email to the customer. Um, this will send whatever email you've configured to send them. Um, you can configure that in your settings. If for whatever reason you want to create this appointment but not email them, just uncheck that and it won't send them that email. So Luke, um, can you uh, talk about the tuning um, flag there? Yeah, yeah, good call. So uh, down here, uh, this is uh, this is an important section. Um, uh, okay, so down here it lists all the pianos that we pulled in for this appointment. Um, and there's this other button here that says this is a tuning for this piano. So this is a Steinway piano. This is one that we have on file for them. And this is saying that, that this appointment is going to be a tuning. This is important because of the way Gazelle's reminders work. Um, Gazelle's reminders remind them of the next tuning that's due. So if you tell Gazelle that this appointment is a tuning appointment for this piano, then six months from this appointment, we know that this piano is due for another service call or 12 months, depending on whatever the service interval is. So that is actually one of the keys of how Gazelle ties into knowing when to remind the customer. So it's important if this is a tuning for the piano to check this checkbox, that keys into our reminder system. If it's not a tuning or you know, you're just going to uh, do a repair or a cleaning or something uh, that's not necessarily a, a, you would consider a tuning, if you don't want to reset their reminder schedule, um, uncheck this box and you can create an appointment for them but not have it affect their reminder schedule. Okay, um, you're gonna see that in a couple of different places. I'm gonna show you that on mobile as well. Um, and this is an important, important aspect to keep in mind that uh, this checkbox will reset their reminder schedule to, to start going out um, based on their service interval. Okay, so I'm not gonna create this appointment. Um, uh, yes, let's lose those changes. I am going to create another appointment though. I wanna show you how to manually book. So there's a couple of different ways that you could manually book an appointment. Um, probably the easiest way is to just click on a date on the calendar. Uh, let's say we wanna fit somebody in here at 11 o'clock. Just click and drag and um, we're manually gonna create this appointment. And so you say which type of appointment it is, this is, this is or which type of, event, of an event this is. This is going to be an appointment. Who is it for? Again, this is very similar. We choose which client it's for. And now we've, we've selected a, if you notice, we've selected a two hour slot, but the, the services that we've selected are an hour and a half. And so right here, Gazelle is just saying that we've selected an extra 20 minutes um, are we sure we want to do that? Um, the, uh, the extra 10 minutes is because of a buffer time that we add. Um, I'm going to go into that in a little bit. Um, we haven't covered the buffer time yet. Um, if, if this is fine, if you're just manually booking and you know that you actually want a two hour time slot, just ignore this and move on. Um, now from here, you can, if you click on search calendar, we're going to search your calendar again on this particular day, just like we did for the smart scheduling. But if I'm manually booking, I want to click this button over here and this is, uh, to book this specific date and time. And it's going to skip the search and just go straight to the last section and let me manually book this time. So 11 o'clock for two hours for this customer, pulled in their piano, this is a tuning, all this. So that's how you would manually book an appointment. And for these, you can adjust. Now, keep in mind, um, no drive time is calculated or um, we're not calculating anything else. This is purely um, you just clicking and dragging and selecting a time slot on the calendar. Okay. All right. Um, do we have any questions about how this works on the website for, for technicians? Nathan, is anybody popping up any questions? Nope. Nothing related to this. Nope. Okay. Well, feel free to keep asking questions. We can bounce back to this if you have any questions. Um, I'm going to move on to um, how this works in the mobile app. Okay. So I've got a... Um, uh, a simulator here um, of, of what the mobile app looks like. And this is on the today view of the mobile app. Um, 
now a, a little aside, we've been hinting for a while now that we're working on a new mobile app and we're getting, we're getting close. We're so excited. I uh, can't wait to release it. Um, but this is on, on our current version 1.0 uh, mobile app. Um, so to schedule an appointment on the mobile app, what you do is down here in the bottom right corner is this little and click schedule an appointment. Hey Luke, you're getting really choppy. Um, oh, just okay. I'm um, not sure why. Is that any better? Hopefully. Yeah. Maybe just okay. say the last sentence again. Okay. Um, I uh, check. Make sure my backups are disabled. Oh, my backups just started. Hold on. <laughs> So I think that's back, why it was just backing up the back up of my computer. <laughs> uh, we do have a question actually real quick before you okay. get into the mobile too far. Sure. Um, so Brad Fant asks, uh, if you manually schedule appointment by click and drag feature, does it check drive time after it is on the calendar and flag you if there isn't enough drive time? No, it does not. If you're manually booking, we don't do any checking. We don't check for anything. We just assume if you clicked and drag that you knew what you were doing um, and you wanted to do that for whatever reason. The mobile app on the today, on the itinerary will probably give you a warning that you may not have enough drive time. Uh, That's time true. Yeah. To get from appointment to appointment. That's but, a good point. Yeah. Um, so on the on the on the itinerary view here, it will show you the drive time from even if it was manually scheduled, because um, that happens separate as a separate process. So yeah, if if there was no um, not enough time or whatever, um, there would be a little warning here on your mobile app. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple more questions. Wow, there. Questions are rolling in. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, okay. So we have another question. Uh, it said, you said to click the up arrow as a shortcut from the calendar. I missed where the up arrow was. Also, the color thing does not help uh, for the mouse, I think. Uh, so, sorry. Yeah, the mouse is really tiny there. You um, may just need to try to wiggle it around. But uh, can you show, flip okay. back over to the main calendar? And I think the up arrow that... Uh, the question was about is the one right next to the search your calendar. Where oh, oh, oh that I see. Okay. Um, yeah. So there's a little up arrow right here um, in the bottom right corner. Um, hopefully you can see that. <laughs> I'm wiggling the mouse. Um, that if let me uh, let me pull in a client here. This right down here in the bottom corner. Um, that little up arrow will pull up uh, to let you choose a target date that's different than today. If you don't use this and you just click on search all calendars, that will search for the earliest available option. Um, you may have been referring to on the mobile app. I was talking about this little up arrow down here in the bottom right corner. Um, hopefully you can see that. Um, that's where you go on the mobile app to schedule an appointment, but I haven't quite gotten there yet. We started getting questions. Okay, so another question, is there any way to uh, control what is optional information versus required information from the customer? Uh, um, no, there is not. Um, so actually all of the piano information is optional um, and all of the contact information is not optional. Um, so we, we make all of the piano information optional because um, we, our goals with the self scheduler was to make it as low of a barrier to schedule as possible. Um, we can I interrupt you just a second? I, I don't think the question is about the self scheduler there because oh, okay. uh, we haven't gotten to the self scheduler. Um, I, I suspect it's about um, uh, the the actual um, uh, in, when when you go to schedule an appointment on the calendar on the web calendar. Gotcha. Click the, um, click no, the, the, all of the information that is that is shown there is is re, uh, if it's required in Gazelle, it's, we we need it to know when the appointment is scheduled. Um, but all again, all the piano information is optional um, and. Um, but all of the appointment information is required, I believe. Okay, and sorry, trying to yep, uh, trying to get through all the questions here. They're coming. <laughs> um, okay, so another question uh, on the on the the online calendar does not list drive time like the mobile uh, for the day. Can that be added to the online calendar? Um, um, do the yes. shift click. Yep. Uh, it, well, that I think that's what they're referring to. Actually, that does not um, add it right now. Um, so if you click on this little map icon for the day, um, it shows downtime. It does not show drive time. Yes, um, ah. we, we will be adding that. Um, we actually added something for the new mobile app that will. Anyway, technical mumbo jumbo. There was a reason that we didn't add it, but we've fixed that, and we now need to add that back to the website. So yes, that will be coming. 
So talking about the new mobile app, there is one question here that I okay. figured we'd get this, but uh, asking when the new mobile app is going to be available. <laughs> um, sometime in the next decade. No, I'm kidding. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> we, wow. We, um, we, we are very close. Um, so uh, I, I can't give you an exact date. I, I would be curious for me to give an exact date. We don't have an exact date. It will be ready. Um, when, when we've polished everything up and know that it's done. Um, we've been working on it since January, pretty much full-time, both Nathan and I. Um, and we are working on the very last features now. Um, so it will be pretty soon. Um, we're, we're, getting, we're getting really close. <laughs> Hope that answers the question well enough. Okay, and I think that's all the questions we've had so far, so. Okay. Mobile. Yeah, so let's move to mobile. Um, so on the current mobile app, if you want to schedule a, an appointment, um, click down here on the bottom uh, to schedule an appointment. Click on schedule an appointment and it pulls in this. Now this is a similar workflow to what we have on the website. So you, you type in a, a client's name. Let's search for one of these tester clients. Again, it pulls in all this information, the pianos. You can adjust this. So if you click on, click on one of these, I can edit what services are selected. Um, and then down here at the bottom is that little checkbox to say that this is a tuning for this piano. Um, now this, normally you probably don't need to worry about this because the services that are selected also say whether the service is a tuning. And if you select a service that is a tuning, it will automatically check that the appointment is going to be a tuning for that piano. Um, so in general, you don't necessarily need to always check that. Um, but uh, I mentioned that there um, just so you know it's there. Um, and it is, it is an important concept. Um, but in general, through the normal process of things, you, you probably shouldn't need to worry about checking that because since I checked this option as my service, it automatically checked down here that this would be turned on, if that makes sense. Okay, um, I could add more pianos to this service call, um, select which technicians this is for, and then select when, what, what time, what the target date for this appointment, and by default, it is the earliest available. So I click on this to schedule. Now it's doing that same search behind the scenes to, to search the calendar to see what's available. And then again, we show um, options um, based on what, what the availability is. So the green ones are the best options. Yellow are not so great, but still okay. Um, and then the red are, are the worst options. And you can click on one of these and then click on one of the time slots that are available and it will pull you over to this final screen that lets you, you know, again, add more notes here. If you need to adjust anything. Um, and again, the same caveat here, I, you can adjust the, the date and time, but we don't recommend it because we've, we've chosen this time for a very specific reason when you're using the, the smart scheduler here. Um, and you can click whether to send a confirmation email and then click create an appointment. Okay. Um, if I am creating a new, doing this for a new client, let's say, let's reset this. So let's say this is for a new client. Um, I start by looking for their address. Um, and it pulls in, it pulls in their address and lets you continue going on. Um, if you're, if you know more information about the customer, we recommend adding it here. Um, you can add the first name, last name, all this other contact information. Um, but you don't technically have to um, because until the last step. Um, so the, the only thing we need to know right now is the, the address so that we can do that, that smart search. Um, well, I guess we do need the first name here. So click done. And then, um, their piano, again, if you know any other piano information, you can add that here. Um, and then, uh, which technician it's for search for them and, and all that works the same way. Now, if I'm manually booking appointment, I know that I want this on a particular date. Instead of clicking the smart search button, I can down here click on manually book and I can just choose the date and time manually here. Or if you want to do it from the calendar, um, here, let me go over to the calendar. I could click on a day that I want. And in, in, in any of these downtimes, I can click on this plus icon and I can add an appointment at that slot and then I enter the client's information. Um, well, let me go ahead and do that here just to show you. Um, and again, I could search or um, it's filled in that time slot right here and I can adjust this if I need to. 
Okay, so that's how to manually book through the web app or through the mobile app. Um, let me see, any questions about scheduling through the mobile app that I can answer? There aren't any pending um, and I don't see any hands raised at the moment. Okay. Okay, well, let me move on to the third and final way that, that you can schedule appointments is through the self-scheduler. Um, clients can schedule their own appointments. So there's two ways that a client can get to this. Um, if you have a button on your website that takes them to the self-scheduler, this is what they would see. Um, it's basically a, a blank slate. We don't know who the customer is. We don't know anything about them. And so we just ask them for all of the information. If they are coming from a reminder email that is encoded with um, some information about that customer so that we know who they are. So if they're clicking on a link that comes from a reminder, it already fills in all this information with their piano, with their um, address, with their phone number, all that stuff. So they don't have to fill it in separately. But here for this example case, I'm going to just show um, a new customer that comes in. Let's say there, there, there's a new customer coming in wanting to uh, schedule an appointment. Um, did somebody just ask a question? I just had something flash up on my screen. Yes, uh, we do have a question. Okay. I'm, so we had somebody raise a hand. Oh, nope. He typed in a, he typed it in. Okay. Could you, um, could you show how you just went back a screen from the client on the mobile? You did it real quick. Uh, let's see on mobile from the client. Um, I wasn't viewing a client. Maybe he meant from the scheduler. Um, so I was scheduling an appointment um, and then you can just hit this back arrow and it takes you back to wherever you were. So for example, whatever page I'm on, let's say that I'm looking at invoices here and then I want to schedule an appointment. I can click on this, schedule an appointment and it slides in the scheduler. I can always hit this back arrow here and it goes back to whatever I was at before. In this case, it was invoices. Um, on Android, if you have an Android device to at the at the bottom of your screen, there will be the little back arrow, um, you know, the Android arrow, and you, you can tap that to go back as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that that answered the question. Um, yeah, uh, he sa says, okay, thanks. Okay, great, good. Okay, so back here to the, the self-scheduler. Um, so let me go ahead and, and enter in as if I was a new customer. Um, so we first ask for their address and again, we show it to them on a map. Um, this just prevents, it's another visual indication um, to make sure that they've typed in the right address. We've, we've actually had reports before, before we added this of people typing in an address, but choosing the wrong city. And so it was the same street address, but they chose the wrong city from the drop down, and the, the technician went to the wrong location because the client had at, entered the wrong city. Um, so we added this map just as a little visual indicator um, to the client to make sure that they chose the right city. And then the choose next. And now we ask them uh, for information about their piano. Uh, if they know any of this information, they can. All of this is optional. Again, we've designed this self-scheduler to be um, as easy as possible. There, there's, there should be no dead ends in here. Uh, we, we want, if they don't know this information, they should still be able to click through and schedule. We don't want them to not schedule because they don't know some bit of information. Um, so this is designed to funnel them all the way through to the end um, and, and not have any barriers there. So let's say they do know it's a Steinway Grand and we come down here and they can select which services are available. Now again, this is pulling from your master service list in Gazelle, which we're gonna talk about in another webinar. Um, but uh, just know that when you do that, you can configure all of these to whatever you need for your, um, for your company. But there's also an option to say which of your services customers can self-schedule. So you could have a list of 500 services, but there's only seven of them that customers can schedule themselves. And those would be the ones that show up um, here on the self-scheduler. So let's just say it's a basic service and let's click next. So now here uh, we're choosing the, the target date when, uh, when they want it to be done. Let's just say the, suit, the earliest available. Um, and if you're a single technician company, this will not show up over here. It'll just be the, the calendar centered. If you're a multiple technician company, they can uh, choose which technician it's for or any technician. Um, uh, there's also a way to, 
if it's a return customer to have it um, default to their preferred technician, uh, which we're going to go over that in a little bit later in, the, in this webinar. Um, but for here, we've, we've set this to, to select any technician. And now we're searching the calendar. Now this is doing that same search behind the scenes, searching for appointment slots, but notice we show them, we show the clients some different. Um, we're showing them um, only slots that you have open. We're not showing them your routes for the day or whatever you're going to be um, on other points in time throughout the day. We're just saying I'm available at nine o'clock at 12 o'clock and at two o'clock on these days. So the client then chooses one of these. Um, oh, that's, uh, that's too soon. We're going to go into that. Uh, that's a special case. We're going to go into that later. Um, let me choose one of these. We ask them for all this information. Um, and Um, now, one benefit here is they're filling out your database for you. Um, so as you're using Gazelle, uh, over the course of a year or two, as your customers keep coming back through the reminder system, they're keeping your database updated for you. So um, if, if return customers is going to have all their information filled in here. And if something changed, they will change their phone number here. And suddenly you're going to have the, the latest phone number in your database without you having to do the data entry for it. So it's, it's one benefit of using this self-scheduling system. Okay, so then they click on reserve this appointment and now uh, we've put a reservation on your calendar um, and um, sent you an email. Um, and in the new app, in the new mobile app, we're gonna send um, notifications to the mobile app that will notify you right away uh, that there's a, a new appointment that needs uh, approval. Okay, any questions about the, the self-scheduler? Um, oh, one thing I did not mention also, um, it is, the self-scheduler, we do have it translated into multiple languages and we detect um, based on the browser setting what language to use for the customer. So uh, if, if your customer is coming and they have their computer set to wanting Spanish, then um, uh, Gazelle is going to default to Spanish for them um, or um, you know, Japanese, for example, it will default to Japanese. Um, so you don't need to do anything for that. It's just a little customization, a little nicety that your customers will see, um, and you don't even need to, uh, to worry about that. If we cannot um, detect the language, it will default back to your company's default language. Um, so um, just so you know. We do have a question that came in, Luke. Okay. Um, Will a new phone number replace an existing one or add it to the list of numbers? Good ah, question. I'm glad you asked. Um, so next I was going to show you how to do appointment, appointment reservations and I will cover that when we do that. Um, so yes, I will, I will cover that very shortly. Do we have any other questions or I can go ahead and move on? That is the only one that has come in on self-scheduling. Okay. Um, all right, so let me answer that question then in, in detail. So let me go to appointment or approval. Um, so I'm going to show you appointment approval from the mobile app here. Um, right now, we're recommending that you uh, approve appointments from the mobile app. Um, uh, it is a little bit more robust than we have on our on the website. Um, we're working on an updated version of the website that has um, uh, the more robust version of, of appointment approval, um, but that is not there quite yet. So we recommend at, at the moment, uh, if you can um, approve appointments through the mobile app, it does work perfectly fine through the, uh, through the web app. Um, yeah. It just does not have as much customization. You can't, um, uh, you can basically, you can just approve or decline an appointment through the, through there. You can't um, select which phone number that you want to use uh, some of the customizations that, that are available. So um, which actually ties into the question that, that that guy was asking. So let me show you here. I have an appointment here from Kevin. Uh, I set this up earlier and he entered a different phone number than we had on file. He was an existing customer and he entered a different phone number. So let me show you what you'll see here. What you see is that we did match this up with Kevin. So we know that this is Kevin. He's coming from a returning appointment, um, but there's a couple of conflicts here. Um, basically, this is, what this is saying is he entered a different email than we had on file and he entered a different phone number than we had on file. And so before you move on, you need to resolve these conflicts. So let's go start with the email and we click on resolve. And what this is saying is they entered Kevin at example.com, but we had Kevin Abshire at example.com. 
So we're given a couple of options here. I can replace this email address with what he added, or I could add Kevin at example.com as a new one, but keep his old one further down in the file. So if I click on this button, Kevin at example.com will become the default email address that we would email to them, but it'll keep the old one still on file in case you need it for whatever reason. Um, so in this case, I'm gonna just go ahead and click replace. I'm gonna replace that one. And so that conflict is resolved. We've gone back to the front here and now there's a phone conflict. So let's go ahead and resolve this one. Very similar. Um, it shows what they've entered. It shows what they had on file before. I can replace it or I can add this as a new phone number. Um, and this, this is what uh, is, is we don't have in, on the website version. Um, right now on the website, it will replace the phone number with what they've added and it will make a note on the file that we've replaced it uh, with and add the old phone number in a note on the file. Um, so still no information is lost, but it doesn't give you these options to choose which, um, which way to go, whether you want to replace it or keep the old one. So in this case, I'm going to just go ahead and add it as a, as a new one. Um, and now I'm going through, I see checkboxes all the way through the piano. He didn't change anything on the piano. I don't need to resolve anything there. Everything looks good. I can go ahead and approve this appointment. Okay, so I think that answered his question about uh, the appointment, uh, uh, the, um, the changes in uh, email addresses and phone number. Similar things would happen if they changed something in their name or their address or the piano. Um, there would be a little resolve button here that you could click and it would walk you through those steps that you need to do to resolve that conflict. Now, once you review this, um, this date and time, um, you can come down here and you can approve or decline it. And uh, either one that you do, you could send them an email or you could do it silently if you want. So for example, we get this question actually a fair bit. Um, if you know that something, they, they requested this appointment on October 1st, but since they, you know, after they, reserve the appointment, maybe you talk to them on the phone and you know that something has changed, um, you could go ahead and manually book an appointment and then come in here for this reservation and just turn off, send an email response and decline it. And what that's gonna do is it'll just delete the reservation. Nobody will be notified, it'll just go away. And you know that you've handled it yourself manually and you don't need to worry about it. Um, or, um, you can approve it silently. You know, if you talk to them on the phone and you don't want to send them another email, um, you can just go ahead and approve it without sending them an email. And then click down here on the approve button. All right. Any questions about reservation approval? There was a question that just came in. It's not about reservation approval, but it's okay. about something that you and I talked about earlier today, but we forgot to highlight. Um, uh, the question is, how can I, uh, find the link for uh, my self-scheduling website. Yes, thank you. I did forget to mention that. That was in my notes and I blew right over it. Um, let me go to, okay, so if you're on the calendar, so go into Gazelle on the calendar. Um, I'm glad you mentioned this. There's actually a bunch of buttons here I wanted to go over. Um, this isn't specifically scheduling, but this has to do with the calendar. So to answer your question, there's this little sharing icon right here, um, if you can see my mouse. And um, you click on this and it gives you a bunch of different sharing options. One is your self schedule link right here. And so you can just click on this, it'll copy it and you can then paste it wherever you need to, to do. Um, so you can copy and paste it. So you can put that in your email signature, you can put it on in a button on your website, all that kind of stuff. So this is yep, on Facebook. This will be your self scheduling link. Um, that's unique to you and your company. Um, down here also, if you want to um, share your calendar with your spouse or somebody, you can enable sharing here and um, then give them this link and they will be able to add that to their calendar. It's a standard iCal format that um, pretty much any calendar can do. Um, there's a, on any good calendar would let you have a way to, um, to do that. So um, it has a way to import a calendar. So you, on Google, there's a way to do it. On um, Apple Calendar, there's a way to do that. So just send your, whoever you want to share this calendar with, send them that link, and then they will be able to see all of your appointments, when you're going to be where, um, and all that information. And it doesn't even need to be some a, a different human. <laughs> you can share it with yourself. So for example, if you want um, your Gazelle calendar to also appear in your Google Calendar. Um, on your phone, go, yeah. On your phone, yep or your Apple calendar on your phone, 
um, which is handy like if you're away from uh, internet access uh, or, or you know if you're on the plane and you whatever and you want to check out what your schedule is or whatever yeah. you'll have it there on your on your phone's calendar so you can share it with yourself as well yeah and that's a good point too um, you don't want to give this link to somebody that you don't trust either because um, in this in all of the appointments we put in information about your customers um, so that you'll have it on your calendar so for that exact case where you've you've synced it with your calendar on your phone um, we have the address of the customer, their phone number, and I believe their email address um, and some other information about the appointment. So um, anybody that you share this with will get all that information about your customers as well. So. They won't be able to change your, it's, it's read only. Right. Um, they yeah. won't be able to change your calendar, but they would see information about your customers. Yep. Okay, we have a couple other questions that have come in. Okay. Uh, oh, Actually, I just interrupted you. You were going to show both of those buttons. You showed the share button first. Yeah. Yeah. Let me do that real quick. Um, yep. So that's the sharing button. There's this also the settings button over here. Um, and you can click on this. There's, there's a couple different options here that you can customize your calendar. So on the calendar, uh, you can say which view you want to see by default when you come to the calendar. So month view, week view, day view, or four day view. So that's just where it comes to when you click on the, when you first visit the calendar. Um, you can also customize what you see. Um, so let's say here we want to show postal code instead of the title. Let me show you what that looks like. So notice down here all of these switch to postal code. So now um, this can be helpful if you're manually scheduling appointments um, or you know, for whatever reason um, you can change that. Uh, so all of these are, are different options of, of things that you can show on the calendar by default. Um, and then also you can change the, uh, the default font size on the calendar. Um, good for small screens. Um, I believe we default it to something kind of small. Uh, we did that so that it fits a lot of information in there. Uh, but if you're have, having trouble reading that, you can bump that up a little bit. Um, and then there's these other options that I think are, are fairly self-explanatory, um, but uh, I'll, I'll go through them here real quick. Um, you can show availability on, on the calendar background. That is this little green box, if you've noticed that. Um, those are days that you are available to schedule. And if you click on a day, it shows you the times that you're available. So from 8 a.m. till 5 p.m. I'm available on this day. So that uh, this option right here, show availability on calendar background, that controls whether that's shown or not. Um, confirmation warnings shows whether, uh, let's see here, let me go to um, the month view. Uh, these little um, red triangles show whether the customer has confirmed the appointment or not. And so that option turns those on or off. If you don't care about confirmations, you can turn that off. Um, show non schedulable users, that's over here on the left. It shows um, if you're a multiple technician company with several uh, office, office assistants, if you uncheck this, the office assistants will not show up on the calendar. Um, it's just a way to reduce clutter if you have a lot of people working for your company. Um, and then whether or not you wanna send appointment confirmations by default. That controls this button down here when you're scheduling an appointment down here in the bottom left. It, it, conf it checks whether this button is checked or not by default when you're creating an appointment. All right, um, so that goes through all those options. Uh, Nathan, what was that question that we had? Uh, they keep rolling in, so we have four okay. uh, at okay. the moment. Um, the first one is, uh, not sure if this question has been answered. Can I have two users shown automatically together on the calendar? Yes, you can. Um, I, so that's what this is over here. I can check uh, multiple calendars. And I don't think in this example, oh, we do. So Fred down here. All uh, oh, right, we got a, We put in a reservation for Fred. Um, so right here, you can see the Fred's color is blue. And right here, you see blue on this calendar. Let me go to the day view and you can see it better. Um, so you can see Fred has Julia scheduled it at, two, at 9 a.m. Um, and you, if you have multiple technicians, you can check them all or as few as you want um, to show them. Show what it looks like on the on the week view there too, because it, yeah. it's a little bit easier to see there. Yep. So there's the week view. Yep. So in the Gazelle calendar, it, it's color coded per user. So that's uh, that's that's what the colors are for. So when you check a user, uh, their color will be shown over here. Yep. All right. So that was the first one. Uh, the second question is, uh, why does it take at least overnight for appointments on Gazelle to show up on the Google calendar? Mm. Um, 
Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have any control over that. Um, Google itself sets its own syncing schedule about how often they, they check Gazelle for um, updates. And I believe they do it about every 12 hours. Um, and um, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about that. Uh, it's, it's totally up to them. Um, we, we push it out there and it's available, but it's up to them to check it. And so um, there's actually, it, it's been a problem for uh, a decade. Um, I, we, we researched this problem and we've had seen reports of people complaining about it um, over 10 years ago. Um, and unfortunately they uh, have not responded to it. <laughs> Um, the next question actually is very similar. Is it uh, still true that the Google Calendar takes a day or two to update the content from Gazelle? I think syncing takes for a while. Yeah, it does, and unfortunately. It does. And yep. um, yeah. All right. Uh, the next one says, uh, actually, it sounds like as an added, oh, yeah, this is actually a clever, uh, clever idea. So he says, as an added note, if you share your Gazelle calendar with yourself to say your Google Calendar, then you can share it from your Google Calendar with a spouse or a child, and you uh -huh. can choose the option to just make the secondary calendar only show as busy or free. Oh, and that, clever. That can be handy so they can see you're unavailable, but they don't see the details about your customers. So that's actually first I've ever heard of that, but that's a yeah, great idea. <laughs> that is very clever. Good, yep. good idea. Good yep. idea. Uh, okay, and then there's one more, and I'm not sure of the context on this one. Um, it says you skipped an appointment for the next day schedule. Um, and unfortunately, I'm not sure of the context there. So if you can fill us in a little bit more on the context, we can get some, uh, get you more. <laughs> get yeah. the answer for you, but yeah, okay. sorry. I'm not quite sure what you're asking there. If you get uh, maybe a little bit more detail, uh, we can answer that for you. All right. So I'm going to mark that one as answered for now. All right. Okay. And that's all. So, all right. Well, that um, concludes uh, this section um, where we're going to walk through how scheduling works. Um, next, we're going to go into um, uh, configuration, how to configure Gazelle's uh, scheduler. So, wow, we are, we're already almost an hour in. <laughs> Holy cow. Uh, we are not going to get through all this tonight. <laughs> we are still on page one of four, four pages of notes. <laughs> all right. Um, we might have to uh, schedule another webinar to, to do the rest of this at some other date. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll keep going and see how far we can get tonight. Um, also, I, I forgot to mention that this is re being recorded and we will um, uh, give you guys a link to it if you want to watch it later as well. Okay, so configuring your availability. Um, let me... uh, okay, it, sorry, we, yep. we've got more context. Um, okay. So you were scheduling an appointment and selected the next day and got the error message that goes to the customer, but did not explain how that works. You were scheduling an appointment and selected the next day. Next day. And got the error message. That goes to the customer. Hmm. The error was message. that on the, on the, the self scheduler or was that on the, uh, when I was scheduling an appointment on the, on the desktop web application? Uh, it doesn't say here. Uh, Oh, sorry. oh, the, uh, sorry. Yes. Okay. Somebody else filled in the, uh, the details. So yeah, you can't schedule because it's such short notice. That oh, was, yes. The, yes. the short notice thing. Yes. That I'm going to cover that here in the configuration uh, when we're talking about the short term availability. Um, yep. So we'll get to that uh, very shortly, actually. Um, thank you everyone uh, for filling in details. Yeah. There. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm being dense. <laughs> I, was, uh, I, I was not thinking clearly. Okay, so I am going to delay that, but we, we will get to that when we're talking about configuration. Okay, so let me talk about configuring um, your availability to say when you are available to be scheduled. Now, this is important because um, Gazelle will happily schedule any time of the day that you want, um, but you probably don't want uh, customers scheduling at 8 o'clock at night to, to book an appointment for 8 o'clock at night um, on your calendar. 
Um, so it's important to block off times of your day when, you, when you're available to work. Now, of course, Gazelle is working 24 seven, so your customers can go online and schedule, they can go online and schedule an appointment anytime, but the actual appointment slots that we offer them, you want to constrain those to your work hours. So how do you do that in Gazelle? So it all comes down to what we call a service area. And a service area has two components to it. It has a location, which is a point on a map, and it has a drive time radius around that location. So for example, your home, and let's say I want to service an area 30 minutes of drive time away from my home. So the furthest I would ever drive is 30 minutes from my home to go to a customer's house. Okay, so those are the two components that make up a service area. So let me show you an example here. Let's say that we're uh, servicing Knoxville, um, Tennessee area. And uh, this is, maybe it's my home, but whatever it is, this is where I've said is the center of my service area. It's an address on a map. It's a point that we've located. And it is important that this is a, uh, an address that our mapping provider knows about. So when you go in and configure this, it will um, verify that this is an address that we know about. We need to get, um, latitude and longitude, very specific coordinates for this address. So you put in an address, it's the point on a map, and then you also put in a drive time around that. And now notice that this is kind of a blob, it's not a circle. And that's because um, uh, it, it's drive times to every point on the map. So for example, notice out here, 30 minutes of drive time takes you further out on a highway than it does here on some of these back roads. And since Gazelle actually takes um, traffic into account, this actually kind of grows and shrinks throughout the day. So um, at noon, you might be able to go further out in 30 minutes, whereas at eight o'clock in the morning during rush hour, you might not be able to go as far out. Um, so it, we handle that automatically for you and it kind of flexes around this area. So in general though, you want to set it to, um, you don't need to be too particular about how far out you go. Just say, in general, I want to service an area about 60 minute drive around this particular location. And Gazelle is going to uh, handle all that for you. Um, there is a couple of exceptions to that that we're going to get to uh, in, in a little bit, but I'm going to keep it simple here for now. So a, a service area is just a point on a map and a radius of drive time around there. Um, and again, I, I, don't, I think I mentioned this, but I want to make sure that I did. It's drive time not mileage. So this isn't 30 miles, this is 30 minutes. There's a 30 minute drive time around this area. Okay, so let me go into a live demo of how to configure a service area. So you click up here on settings in, in Gazelle when you log into the web app. And then over here on the left, go down to scheduling policies. It's up here on the left, click edit. And now there's a couple of different tabs here. Uh, this is where we're going to, this whole section is about these different policies. But here we, we're just concerned about availability. This is where you configure your service areas. So this is right here, this is our Concord service area. Um, and we're saying we're doing a 60 minute drive time around this address in Concord, North Carolina. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we give it a, a date to say when it's effective. So this is effective January 1st, 2015, and there's no end date. So um, pretty much now and forever, this is going to be my, my service area and drive times. Now inside of a service area, you can configure your work hours when you're available to work. So in this case, I've set up, we call them rule sets. I've set up a rule set that says I work Monday, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And my start of day address is this location and my end of day address is this location. Now by default, so this is where it gets a little bit uh, complicated. So, so uh, try, to, try to track with me here. Um, by default, we, we pull in the center of your service area as the same address for all of these. Um, just because more often than not, it's going to be your home and it, that's what you want on all of these. But it doesn't necessarily have to be the case. So for example, we, had, uh, we have several customers that what they do is they drop their kid off at daycare in the morning. And so they want to start their day at eight o'clock and they know they're going to be already up at this daycare center so may as well start scheduling appointments up there rather than having me drive all the way back home so they put in the address of their daycare center here as their start of day location and so now gazelle is going to optimize their routes so that at the beginning of the day we're looking for appointments near their daycare center and towards the end of the day we're going to favor appointments near their home and so all day they're going to be kind of doing this arc around 
to their home. Now, you know, it's not always going to be that perfect, but in general, um, that's what Gazelle would favor. Um, <clears throat> so let me go into some specifics here about how you can configure these, these work days. So this is a very simple case. I work the same hours Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, I can configure this to say, let's say it's nine o'clock. I, I work nine to six instead. Um, that's perfectly fine. And then there's two options here. I can say that I leave my home at this time or I want my first appointment to be at this time. Now this is a little bit of a subtle distinction here, but it's, it's pretty important. If I say that I wanna leave my home at 9 a.m., um, that means that if your first appointment is a 15 minute drive away, then your first appointment is gonna be 9.15 a.m. Um, or if your first appointment is an hour away, your first appointment is gonna be 10 a.m. But if I choose this option here, where I start, I, my first appointment is at 9 a.m., then that means in order to reach that appointment, I might not need to leave at 8 a.m. or leave at 8.45 a.m., depending on how far the drive time is. Um, so we give you that flexibility and the exact same for ending the day. I could say I want to be home. I want to be pulling into my driveway at 6 p.m. Um, or I could say, you know, I don't necessarily care when I get home, but just make my last appointment at 6 p.m. And, <clears throat> and then I'll drive home from there and it doesn't matter how long it is. Um, and then over here on the left, I can choose the days of the week. So I'm going to just say that this is for Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And I'm going to show you later how you can do a, a separate set for Tuesday and Thursday. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time over here on uh, the preferred appointment times. And uh, there's a little bit of confusion, I think. We, we get this question a fair bit of, of how preferred appointment times work in Gazelle. So, um, Nathan, was there? Actually, we've got a pending question that's very, uh, that's hinting towards that. Um, okay. So, uh, okay. Go ahead and read it. Go ahead. Okay. So he says, uh, you may get to the, I'm sorry, what was that? No, go ahead. I said, I'll, I can answer it as we go. Okay. Uh, he said, you may get to this, but uh, if I wanted to schedule four appointments per day exclusively at set times, say nine, 11, one, three, do I accomplish that by turning off the option to use the real time drive times? Um, gotcha. So, um, so to answer that question, no, um, there really is not a way to do that in Gazelle. Gazelle's scheduler is designed to optimize your drive times. So if you're wanting to do that, you need to manually book your appointments. Um, yep. you, you wouldn't use the Gazelle scheduler for that. Um, but the confusion that Luke was getting to that he was alluding to. Yeah, the, the confusion is it makes it, this kind of makes it look like you can do that. <laughs> um, so what this though is for um, is if there's a completely open day, um, if you have no appointments on the calendar, um, what time slots would you offer that customer on that day? Um, so if, uh, let's say it's a completely open day. In this case, we would offer them 8 a.m., 10 a.m., or 1 p.m. Um, once an appointment gets on a calendar, Gazelle uses that as an anchor point. And then we schedule the next appointment is either before that appointment or after that appointment. And we calculate drive time away from that appointment. So we're, as soon as an appointment is on your calendar, we're booking your appointments to pack your day around that appointment. And then once a second appointment gets on your calendar, then we're booking around both of those two appointments. The end result is that your day is going to be compact. The drive times are optimized around that. So if, if you've got, you know, several appointments, if, if you're, if you have one appointment on the calendar and the next one is just five minutes away, it's going to end five minutes before the previous one and you'll be just driving right next and you're going to, you know, you're not wasting that time between there um, by saying that I've got a two hour slot all the time. Um, you know, it might be a one hour appointment and there's only a five minute drive time, then you're going to be sitting there for 55 minutes. So Gazelle is designed to optimize that and take that downtime away. Okay, so this preferred appointment times is only affects open days, completely open days. And these are the times that we would offer them. Okay, so I'm gonna save this. And, um, oh, ha. Uh, so this appointment, it's telling me that this appointment time would never happen because it's before my start of day. So let me change this back to 8 a.m. I had adjusted that. There we go. So now I've changed it, if you, if you recall, to Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. But now I can add another workday configuration. Let's say for Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm gonna work until noon, okay? And I want to let's add a slot for 8 a.m. and a slot for 10 a.m. for open days. 
Okay, so now this is what my availability is going to look like. Now I am available Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., or Tuesday and Thursday from 8 a.m. To, to noon. Okay. Now, um, are there any questions about that, Nathan? Uh, not about that. There are a couple pending questions, um, and we'll get to them in, uh, in just a moment. Okay, great. So you can also have multiple service areas that take effect. Um, so in this case, I've only got one service area, but... Actually, can I, can I make a quick distinction? Because it will, uh, I think yeah. it will answer one of these questions. Um, since we're talking service areas here specifically, a service area is for a, a specific technician. So each uh, technician yeah. can have their own service area. So you can have, you know, for a multi-tech company, you can have one, ser um, one tech that's servicing the north side of town, another servicing south side, another servicing Hawaii uh, or, you know, or Iceland or what, it doesn't matter. But um, yeah. the service area is specific to the technician. Yep, that, that's good. I, I, that was in my notes and I forgot to mention it. Thank you. Um, so you have to configure this for each of your technicians, yes. But let's say that, um, let's say you spend half your time in North Carolina and half of your time in the Bahamas. Um, so six months out of the year, you're gonna be in the Bahamas. So I can add another service area over here. Um, let's call this Bahamas. And I can say when the next time I'm gonna be out there is gonna be, let's say it's gonna be uh, November 1st through, um, say uh, December 31st. So for two months, I'm gonna be in the Bahamas. Um, oh boy, I don't know an address in the Bahamas. <laughs> <laughs> I should, I I'll see if that. I could look one up for you. Nah, don't worry about it. I'll just put in, right. I'll just put in a, a random address here. Pretend that's in the Bahamas. Um, <laughs> and okay, so let me save this. So now if you see over here, I've got two, I've got two service areas. We have our Concord service area and we've got our Bahamas service area. And over here, I haven't set up any rule sets for this. So during this time period from November 1st to December 31st, what times do I want to be available? So let's say, um, uh, okay, create this and I can add workday configurations for this. So let's say when I'm there, I wanna work every day, but only um, afternoons. So let's go 12 to four, because um, I'm on vacation. So first one is at 12, second one can be at four, or at, at two. Okay, so now between those dates, I'm gonna be available noon to four for all of my Bahama clients. Now what's gonna happen is if you have, you have a regular clientele in the Bahamas um, for whenever you're down there, and they go to your self-scheduling link, they type in their address, and they are only going to see options that apply to the service area where they are located. So they won't ever see any options for your Concord area because they would be outside of that service area. So we're only gonna ever show them dates when you're gonna be there between November 1st and December 31st. And we're, while you're there, we're also gonna optimize your drive time. And then also, likewise, this service area is going to trump your Concord service area between these dates so that none of these dates are going to be offered while you're in the Bahamas. But once you get back, your Concord one is gonna come back and, and take effect. Now, if you're ever wondering, if you wanna see how this all plays out, we've got this little um, tool down here. You, we got it's your, scheduler, your schedule calendar down here. And you can see what Gazelle thinks it's gonna be on a calendar. So for each particular day, you can just use this as a check to see. So you can see in Concord, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I'm available 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And on Tuesday and Thursday, I'm available 8 a.m. to noon, which is what we configured. But I go over here and starting November 1st, my Bahamas one takes effect um, from November 1st through December 31st. And then it goes back to Concord, as you can see. Why don't you flip over to the slides that demonstrate that too? Yes, thank you. So um, I do have a couple of slides here that show how um, it can be kind of confusing which service area um, takes effect when. So let me show you an example of this. So let's say we've got two service areas here. This would be a good example of, of the Bahamas one. So I have one, A, which starts on a particular date and has no end date. In the example I just showed you, that would be the Concord one. 
Um, it starts on January 1st and has no end date. That's kind of the baseline. And then we created another service area that, that went between two dates. And um, as soon as that one takes effect, uh, um, the start date of that, uh, that one takes effect until the end date, and then it goes back to the um, to A. Now, <clears throat> the way we figure out which one is which is we sort them all by their start date. And chronologically, we sort them chronologically by their start date. And the one that is um, chronologically later um, is the one that takes effect. So for example, you can see um, June 1st through August 31st. June 1st is the, the latest start date that we have. And because June 1st is later than January 1st. So that one is the one that's going to take effect. But as soon as the end date goes, we go back to whatever start date um, is, whatever. Is, is the latest that has no end date yet that is still taking into effect. So let me go to another example here. You can see um, if we added a third service area, um, you can see how that works. Very similar rules. And then another complication here, we've got another one um, that adds. So this is all very, very odd scenarios. More than likely, you're just going to have one service area, possibly two. Um, but just know that the way Gazelle works is based on the it chooses which service area is takes effect based on the start date. And more often than not, you really don't need to worry about this because um, Gazelle will pretty much do what you intend to do. Um, if, if you set a start date and an end date for a service area, um, Gazelle is gonna make that one be effective during those times, unless there's another one that, that kind of supersedes it. So, um, if you have questions about how that works, I know that that was really technical and probably more detailed than you care about. Um, but feel free to ask us if you run into a weird scenario where it doesn't make sense. So we do have some pending questions related to service areas. Uh, okay. Two Shoot. specifically on this and another one um, about uh, some routing or mapping stuff that I think we will be touching on in a bit, but we'll ask it in. Anyway, all right. Uh, first one says, what if I want to start from home? on Tuesday and Thursday, <laughs> and at the daycare, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Gotcha. Um, we actually do not support that currently. Um, uh, so that right now is actually not possible. Um, so you would need to do, probably just choose the, uh, maybe your home address or um, uh, whatever the, the most common one would be uh, at that. But at this point in time, no, we do not support that. Flip. Flip over to the Concord uh, one there real quick. Yeah. And yeah, so, and that's because the, the start and the end time is on the rule set, uh, not on the workday configuration. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, all right. Next question was, uh, let me mark that one as answered. Um, are the workday rules nested under the service area necessarily, or can you prioritize the availability and switch service areas as necessary? For example, Normally, I might want to only go to X county on certain days, but on an open day, I could accommodate a client there, possible. Mm -hmm. Or would Gazelle not show me as available on that day for that client? Gotcha. Um, no, in, in general, a service area kind of blankets a, a, a chunk of time. Um, so there isn't the concept of a floating, area, a floating service area on an open day. Yeah. Um, so no, it, it does not work that way currently. Um, it's a good idea. Uh, we have had people uh, request that and we've, we've talked about ways to do that, um, but currently it does not. If, if you have a specific um, question about how to make that work for you, we do have um, some workarounds that we've done for people. So contact us at support and we can, um, there are some workarounds ways that you could probably make something like that work. Um, but service areas specifically are, are not designed to work that way. Okay, so um, another question here is um, we have a large service. Oh boy, I had, had another one just come in that, uh, that I, it's kind of funny. We've had this one asked. Uh, so anyway, so yeah, so um, <laughs> we have a large service area. Is it possible to say that we only service South County one day per week? Yeah, so what you could do is you could have two service areas, basically one that's set up for um, you know, four days a week on the north side, one that's set up on the south side for... Um, oh, no, and not really. Overlapping, um, overlapping times. Go ahead. Or, or overlapping no, you, areas. Couldn't you? 
Um, Cause we no. do that regularly for folks. Um, so for, for sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so his question is, can they service South side of the County one day a week, North side four days a week. So we have, we have folks that, um, Well, I guess the one for that I was thinking of specifically wasn't quite the same, but um, so what I what I, my suggestion there was going to be would be to set up a, two separate service areas, one for the south, one for the north, maybe a 60 minute drive time for both, knowing that there's going to be overlap in the map. Oh boy, I'm holding my hand up in front of the camera. Um, there's going to be an overlap in the map, um, kind of on the in the intersection of those two that will be available for the whole week, like the middle of the county, right? But you can't have two service areas with two different addresses that are effective at the same time. Um, so oh, I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because the rule set is applied to the week, so. Yeah. Yep. So no, um, uh, but uh, what, yeah. what, my, my question there would be, why are you doing that? Um, if, um, if you're doing it because you, you want all of those customers, if, if it's a far, a, a far drive time and you only want to do that one time, um, Gazelle is going to um, op be optimizing your routes for you and that's going to kind of happen automatically in even a more robust way than you're thinking of. Um, it's not going to be as linear as I'm only going to be down in the south side of the county on this particular day. So what's normally going to happen is if, if you open up your whole service area for this whole time, um, if somebody schedules down there on the south side of the county, um, we're never going to then bounce you further, you know, off to the north side. As soon as somebody is down there, we've anchored that day down there. And now anybody else that is scheduling on that day is going to get booked around that appointment. And you're suddenly that particular day, you're now going to drive down there, service that appointment and all those, and then drive home. And then the similar thing might happen on the north side of the county on another day. And this all happens automatically with Gazelle's scheduler. So you don't need to take that fine grain of approach of saying when you're gonna be where. We usually just recommend just opening up your whole service area and let Gazelle handle the optimization for you. So Tim just IM'd me um, uh, a, a clever workaround for this. Um, okay. So the idea would be to create a personal event on the south side of the county, make it recurring. Um, yeah. And uh, then that kind of anchors you down on the north side or the south side of the county on yeah. Fridays. Um, yep, so that's true. That, that would work as well. Um, so yeah. what, what that's saying is you can create a personal event, put an address for that personal event in the south side of the county. And that acts as, like what I said, an, an anchor point for that day, just as if somebody had scheduled an appointment for that day. Um, so if you really do want to do that, you, you could do that and just make it a recurring event. But again, um, I would, I would, I would recommend that you try not doing that and just see how Gazelle manages your schedule for you because um, I, I think that it will do a pretty good job of, of tightly packing your appointments without um, bouncing you all around if that was your concern. Okay, next question. Uh, does the service area take into account when you live near a shoreline such as Long Island, North Shore, opposite Connecticut? Um, I, that question was actually asked a little while ago and I, I paused or I, I delayed asking it because I know mm -hmm. we're going to get to that in a bit, but um, mm -hmm. it is getting close to nine and we haven't gotten to that part of the presentation yet. So yeah. uh, does the service area take into account when you live near a shoreline such as Long Island, North Shore, opposite Connecticut? Yes. So um, not exactly sure what you mean by take into account, but I, I, I think if I know what you mean, yes, um, you know, we, uh, we're not going to, drive you out into the water, obviously. Um, but we do take into account, um, like, uh, stream, well, actually, let me, let me jump. I've got a screenshot over here um, later in the presentation. Um, so for example, let's, let's say New York. Um, this is a city that has choke points, for example, um, that you have to go over a bridge. And so, yes, we do take that into account. So if you put your service area, um, like, let's say right here in the middle of Manhattan, um, it, it knows, you know, it's not gonna, it's, it's not 30 minutes as the crow flies over here. It knows that you're gonna need to go up over this choke point and down down here um, in order to get that. And so, so yes, it does take um, shoreline and, and 
even ferries and stuff, we, we handle all of that as well. Yep. And, and it knows to, so further with the choke point, it knows the time of day, you know, going across the uh, George Washington Bridge at eight o'clock in the morning, um, maybe that's a two hour <laughs> bridge wait or something, you know, we're going under a tunnel. Um, so right. the time of day modeling comes into that. And like Luke said to the ferries, um, uh, so our mapping providers have ferry schedules uh, that they uh, provide for us. So we, uh, that, that's all taken into account as well. So um, for example, you know, out in Vancouver, there's a bunch of little islands, ferries between them. Um, and so when you're, when we're trying to find when you can make it from one appointment to the next, we take uh, the ferry times, ferry schedules into account as well. Yep. Um, all right, so that one, if I'm going to mark that one as answered. Um, is it okay if I just keep blowing through questions here, Luke? We've yeah. got several more. Yeah, um, so what happens, <clears throat> what happens when a client clicks on this, uh, but, their, but their address is outside of my service area? Um, okay, um, we're going to get to that in just a minute when we talk about some of the policies. Yep. We, we do have options available for that. Yep. Uh, next is, uh, is there a way to, this is what I was chuckling about a moment ago with the question that we get um, asked. Is there a way to insert a floating lunch break? Uh, <laughs> um, no, there is not uh, yet, unfortunately. Um, we've talked long and hard about this. Um, it's, we have not, the, re the only reason we haven't done it is uh, we have not figured out a good way to, to code it, <laughs> honestly. That's what it comes down to. It is a very complex problem to solve, um, taking into account drive times before and after and all this stuff. Um, what we tell people to do, um, so it's kind of a good problem. Um, we, we had somebody write in that says, uh, Gazelle is packing my schedule so full that I don't have time to eat. Um, so it's kind of a good problem. Um, but what we usually recommend is uh, you could, um, uh, add, add buffer time to your appointments to, um, to pad them out a little bit um, if you need a little bit of a break between them. Um, and so you can do it that way. Um, and that'll kind of space out your day a little bit and then you can take time as necessary. So um, currently that's, that's uh, uh, the best option that we have. Um, we are actively thinking about this and trying to come up with a good solution for that. Um, we just have not um, implemented it yet. Uh, so another question related to time zones, um, is there consideration for multiple time zones? I schedule in the central and I'm in the Eastern. So all my appointment details show Eastern versus central. Yes, uh, so we, uh, we take time zones into account. Um, everything that is scheduled for a particular technician is in that technician's time zone. So uh, even on the calendar, if you're looking at the calendar and you see um, uh, two 8 a.m. appointments, one for one technician, one for another, that is time zone specific. So if uh, that would be 8 a.m. Pacific, if you have somebody on the West Coast, and that would be 8 a.m. Eastern, if you have somebody on the East Coast. Um, and so likewise, if somebody is scheduling for that, uh, somebody on the Pacific Coast, um, they would, all the time slots would be offered in Pacific time zone. Uh, so I'm not sure if that will answer his question or not. Um, so okay. if, if you have a follow-up, um, let us know on that. Uh, another uh, one. Actually, also, let me, let me mention real quick too, yep. um, that this may be more what they were asking. Um, if you're traveling and you're viewing your gazelle calendar, it is, the gazelle calendar is still in the time zone of the user. So um, if you're traveling and you're normally in the Eastern time zone, your gazelle calendar is still going to show in the Eastern time zone. Um, which is different than the way most calendars work. Um, most calendars will kind of switch to your time zone wherever you go. Uh, we did this very specifically because if you're traveling, you're probably calling customers back home and you need to see it in, uh, in, in the time frame of when you're going to be home. So um, it, the, the calendar is locked to the time zone of the, of the user. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so the follow-up says it's more for the communication portion when I confirm with them. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, it will... Um, because he's communicating, he's booking them in Central, but he's in Eastern. So when he's viewing it, his appointment on the phone to them, he has to remember okay. to shift it an hour. 
Yep. When he says, don't forget, I'll be there at 8 a.m. Instead so of... you're saying, so he's saying that his, his service area overlaps the time zone barrier. Yes. And he has some customers that are scheduling in central. Well, he says I schedule in central and I'm in Eastern, but yeah. So he's okay. straddling, straddling the barrier. Uh, it will be in, so whatever time zone the, the user is that they're scheduled for will be what it is. So if, if that's different than the, than the client, the different time zone that the client is scheduling, then you will need to, to confirm that. I believe the email that goes out does have the time zone in it. Um, and on the website, if they're viewing something online and it's different, if the time zone is different than their browser's time zone, it will show the time zone as well. So anything that they're, any communication they're getting from Gazelle should have the time zone as confirmation in there. Um, but when you're talking, yes, you would need to worry about that. Okay. So next question is, is there support for 24 hour format? Um, doesn't say the context like where. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. So um, our, uh, the, the short answer is yes and no. The long answer is yes, eventually. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the, um, the website version um, right now is only 12 hour format. Um, um, except, well, actually, no, that's not true. The calendar, um, yeah, uh, I believe that the website version is just the 12 hour version. Um, but we are in the process of migrating to a new platform and this platform has much better um, uh, localization and internationalization capabilities. So um, that will be coming much better uh, 24 hour support, which is what most people around the world use other than the US. Um, so yes, that, that will be coming more and more as we um, start releasing some of these new things. Um, the, the new mobile app, the version 2.0 mobile app, um, I believe that should be in your local format. Um, I, hmm, I don't know that we've tested that yet, so I can't promise that, but um, it, it will be possible. Um, and uh, we, we will be working towards that goal. So um, more in, in time, more and more will be localized into those types of formats. Okay. And that's the last outstanding question. So. Okay. Well, it is nine o'clock um, and it looks like um, people are still sticking around. So um, I think we're happy to keep going. Uh, we yeah. had somebody chime in earlier saying, uh, keep going we're here all night, but um, I think maybe let's go for another half hour. Um, and if you guys can't stay, um, that's perfectly fine. We're going to have a recording of this and we'll, we'll send it out. Um, but let's, um, we've gotten through probably about a little less than half of <laughs> what we were hoping to get through tonight. We've had some really great questions. Um, but uh, yeah, so let's go for another half an hour. And if, um, if you can't stick around, that's perfectly fine. You're not going to hurt our feelings if you need to drop off. And we'll email you a link with the, um, uh, with the recording. Okay, so let's move on to configuring some of your policies. So... Uh, let me get my notes here. So we did availability, let's do policy configuration. Okay. So the policies are these two tabs right here. We have my policies and company policies. My policies are user specific. So if you have multiple technicians, each technician can have their own set of these. And then there's company wide policies that affect everybody. So we're going to go over the company wide policies first. And these are some ways that you can tweak and configure Gazelle, uh, the scheduling rules. Okay. All right, so the first one here, handling clients outside of your service area. Uh, we had a question about this specifically. So how do you want to handle this? So we leave that up to you. Um, there are two options that you can do. One is you can just say, if they're outside of my service area, do not let them schedule. Just flat out, don't let them schedule. Um, and if that's the case, then we will show them this message um, in the web UI uh, when they're scheduling. So you can customize this message uh, to be whatever you want. Um, but uh, we recommend that you put in your phone number, a way to call you just in case there's a problem 
for whatever reason they, they think you should be in the service area, they could call you and you could make the make the judgment yourself of whether you want to, to schedule them or not. Um, the other option is that we can make it a little fuzzier. We can say, um, only allow clients outside of my service area to schedule if they're within a defined radius of an appointment that's already on my calendar. So that's kind of a hard concept to, to wrap your mind around. So I've, I made a, a little diagram here. Um, let me show you this. So let's say this is our service area, this green blob, and this customer up here wants to schedule. So they're outside of our service area. Normally we would say, I'm sorry, you're outside of our service area. Um, we would show them that message. But if you turn on that option and you already have an appointment that's going to be nearby, then if they're within a certain drive radius around them, like this, let's say it's a 10 minute drive around an existing appointment, then we'll let you go outside of your service area to, to get that client. Um, so this is a good way to kind of, if you're already going to be at the end of your service area, what's another five minute drive outside, right? So, um, or another 10 minute drive. Um, so you can kind of use that to, um, to kind of fudge the, the end, ed, edge cases of your service area. Um, and that is configured right here under handling clients outside of my service area. You can configure the minute drive, that radius around existing appointments on the calendar. Now, these people would never be able to book an open day. Um, they would only be able to book if there's an appointment already on your calendar that's within 10 minutes of them. Okay, so that's that one. Um, next, let's move on to handling an invalid address. So try as we may, um, and as good as data has gotten over the past uh, several years, um, mapping, our mapping providers are not perfect. Um, they do not have perfect mapping data. Um, there's new neighborhoods going in all the time. Um, uh, outside of the US, um, mapping data is not as, as accurate quite yet. Um, they're, they're getting there, especially Google is getting really good. Um, internationally. Um, but if there's ever a case where we come to an address for whatever reason that that our mapping providers do not know about, um, this option says, how do we want to handle that? So in these cases, um, you can say how, basically, we just want to say treat it as a 30 minute drive time. If I can't find the address, treat it as a 30 minute drive time. Or if you want to be really conservative, maybe say it's a 60 minute drive time. Um, just to make sure that you have enough time to drive between these appointments. So what this does is it still lets people schedule online. Um, it still lets them go through. Um, but if there's a problem, um, we don't want to just drop them off a cliff and, and just leave them hanging there and not schedule. We want to get them on your calendar as much as possible. Um, so this would, um, uh, this would basically be a worst case scenario. At, make it a 60 minute drive time if we can't find the exact address. So this is a very important one too. This actually comes into play in, in several different scenarios. Um, so like, like I mentioned, um, new streets, um, uh, countries that don't uh, have as good mapping uh, coverage by our mapping providers. Um, or for example, if you couldn't find the starting or ending day location, um, uh, which it's important when you're creating service areas. To, that's why I stressed earlier that you need to put in the exact address of a starting or ending day um, so that we can, um, uh, so we know the exact location. Um, and then finally, where this comes into play is personal events. If you block off time on your calendar as a personal event, but you do not put an address for that personal event, then um, we don't know where it is and we'll use this drive time between them. So, um, as a tie into that, I, I didn't show, I forgot to show this earlier, but if you're on your calendar, um, let me go here. Let me, let me just jump into a demo real quick and show this. If you're on your calendar and I'm scheduling a, a personal event, let's say, um, uh, let's go here for today and uh, let's schedule uh, an hour right here. Um, let's make it a personal event. Um, you can, you can add an address to personal events and that will help us, um, schedule appointments nearby. So uh, just go here, type in whatever the address is. If, if it's a dentist appointment, type in the address of your dentist, for example. Um, we also have saved locations. So if there's a place that you visit frequently that you do personal um, events to, you can, hard, you can save the location. This is back in settings and you can create a, a list of saved locations and just pull those in right here as kind of a quick way of doing that. So this is important so that we can optimize your routes if you don't do this on personal events, again, 
we will use this invalid address or um, unknown address drive time to get to that personal event, which may not be as optimal. All right, do we have any questions, Nathan? Nope, this? nope. Uh, I had a question. Um, yeah. Can you show where the saved addresses are? Yes, I in the settings. Can. So let me go uh, here. So settings, so I just clicked on settings up here at the top and um, the locations are on the left down here. I can click on edit and I can add, add locations here. So I can give it a title and just give it an address and it's a list of addresses. So these will be pulled in, pulled in then when you're saving an appointment or saving a personal event. Into that drop-down list. Yep. Into this drop-down list right here. Okay, um, next, let's go to address validation requirements. Um, so this is a very special case. Um, uh, the vast majority of the time, you do not want to touch this. Um, bad things can happen if you change this. So. More often than not, um, unless you have a very, very good reason, you want to leave this at um, strict address validation. That said, um, we do have an option where you can turn off strict address validation. What this means is when clients come to the self-scheduler or when you're adding addresses um, into Gazelle, we will not validate that's it, that it's an actual address. Um, or we don't do a strict validation. So for example, instead of requiring them to enter a house number and a street name and a city and a state uh, in, here in the US, um, they could just enter a city. They could just say Charlotte, North Carolina, and we'll let that through just fine. Um, this is useful, again, in, in some countries, um, I believe um, uh, we, we created this for a, an Icelandic customer, uh, somebody in Iceland who um, uh, our mapping coverage was not so great there. Um, it didn't know street numbers, street names, but it didn't know street numbers, house numbers. And so he turned this on so that people could enter in their street name and it would get him close, but it wouldn't get him to the exact address. Um, in general, again, I'm just gonna gloss over this, just um, unless you have a very good reason, uh, just leave this at strict address validation turned on. Um, otherwise, um, your addresses are going to be bad. We're not going to validate them for you. And we're, we're going to, a lot of the time, use this handling invalid address option. And um, our routing is not going to work as well for you. OK, next, um, we've got this self-schedule special instructions. Um, this is a little blob of text that you can have show up at the, on the first page of the self-scheduler. So I believe we have a screenshot of that here. Yeah, right here. So that is this blob of text right here. So you can customize this, uh, some sort of a welcome message, some special instructions that you want to give them, um, anything like that, any promos that you have going on or whatever, you can customize all of that and have that be displayed right here. And likewise, um, this second one is the self-schedule completion message. This is a message that shows up on the last page of the self-scheduler after they have reserved an appointment, made a reservation, and I have a screenshot of that over here. Here we go. So this would be after they've gone through the whole process, they've scheduled, they've reserved an appointment, and then down here is a block of text that we show them, and you can customize this message here. Okay. We have a quick question, uh, not directly related to this, but um, just I'll go ahead and ask it. Uh, what is the difference between a service area and a region, which is a field on the client? Ah. They intended for different purposes. Uh, yeah. yeah, they are. Um, region. Um, I don't know. I don't think we have a region. Do we have a region on the client? Yeah. Um, we have a geo zone. Um, yep. I think it's we have region as well. I believe so. Yeah, we do. Um, that is currently not used for anything, honestly. Um, that was uh, left over from before we had um, smart scheduling in place. So it was a way that you could kind of block off certain regions in your, um, in your service area and just have that show up when you're trying to schedule. But um, since we added the self-scheduler and the smart scheduler, um, this is not even really used anywhere anymore in Gazelle. Um, same with the GeoZone. Um, believe we have that here on an address. Um, that was a similar type of thing. It was just a tag that we added to an address 
um, but that's not really used um, much anymore in Gazelle. Yeah. Um, and so, so to answer your question, it doesn't apply at all to service areas. Service areas kind of supersede region now. It's it's the way to do it. Good question. Okay, moving on, we've got uh, this default technician selection. Um, if you remember, um, I, I touched on this briefly, um, a client, when, when you have a client in Gazelle, you can set them up with a default technician. Uh, we call it a preferred technician. Um, and that's if you have multiple technicians in your company, um, you can tie one of them to a, a particular technician if, you, if they want to have the same person service their instrument over and over. Um, and this option right here says, what, what do we want to show when they come back to the self-scheduler? So I believe we have pictures as well. So that is right here on this section. If a customer is coming back, if we want to highlight, if we want to check automatically their default, their, their preferred technician, or if you want to, by default, check any technician. Um, so it, it's just a little way of tweaking it. If, if, you, if you really don't want to encourage people to choose specific people, then you would set this to have it be any technician, um, which I believe is the default. Um, so uh, and if you only have one technician, then um, this won't even show up for you. Yeah. While you're on the company policies, uh, we have a question. Do you have sample messages for the self-schedule special instructions and the self-schedule completion message? Um, I don't believe we do. I'm just no, checking. No, we don't. By, by default, they're turned off. Um, so by default, yeah. there's nothing. Um, so this is just if there is something that you want to communicate, you can say something. Um, but by default, it's nothing. Um, and they just see gazelle. So you don't have to put anything there. And by default, it, it's, it's blank. Um, so yeah, this is just in the case where you want to communicate something special to them. Okay. All right. We'll move on uh, to the user specific ones. Yeah. So that's all of the company specific ones. Um, let me jump on to the user specific ones. So that's over here on my policies. So each technician has their own set of policies that they can configure. So the first one here is long-term scheduling policy. This is how far in advance do you allow customers to book appointments? Um, <clears throat> if, if you really want people to pre-book, you might set this to a full year, let them uh, book a year in advance, or perhaps a year and some change um, so that they can book 20, uh, 12 months out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, or if you don't pre-book appointments, you might keep this pretty tight, keep it up to 90 days um, if you want to keep your future open. <laughs> Um, so this is, this is kind of open to you. Um, now this really just applies to the self-scheduler. The self-scheduler does a hard limit where we won't offer any options outside of the long-term policy to customers doing the self-scheduling. Um, for you, when you're using the scheduler inside of Gazelle on your mobile app or on the website, um, we'll show a little warning that says it's outside of your long-term or short-term policy, but we'll still let you book it. We don't actually prevent you from doing it. Um, but we do prevent customers from booking their own appointments that are outside of these two. So that's, that's the long-term policy and uh, the short-term policy is similar. Um, you can say, don't let them book online um, less than 20, 20, than 72 hours in advance. Um, so this is just kind of a way that they, somebody can't um, sneak a reservation in for an hour from now. Um, and maybe you didn't actually see it and they were expecting it to be there and you know, all that. Um, so this is just a way um, to prevent that. Um, for both of these, if they hit, hit one of those, you, you can optionally give them a, um, uh, there's a, this message will show up if it's, out, if it's uh, outside the long-term limit, or if it's in the short-term limit, this one you actually have a couple of other options. You can say, don't show, it, don't show anything at all within 72 hours, or I could still show it to let them know I do have something available, but when they click on it, it shows them this message instead of actually letting them book, and it says, this is available, but because of the short-term notice, you need to call me in order to book this option. Um, so that way, uh, again, it's, it's just a way to make sure that you know of that and, and something can't just sneak onto your calendar without you realizing it. Now, again, nothing's ever gonna sneak onto your calendar because these are reservations and you still have to approve them. But 
you still wouldn't want a reservation to come in right away and the customer gets mad that you never responded, even though they just snuck it in at the last minute. So this is kind of a way to, to prevent that from happening. And this is what uh, somebody asked the question earlier when uh, they said that I, I clicked on something on this self scheduler and um, it, it showed that the option was not available. That was the message that it popped up here. It popped up the short term message um, because it was it was for the very next day. And um, I had this policy set to not let me schedule that. All right, next is the appointment buffer time. I hinted at this earlier. Um, we have the option of when you schedule in Gazelle to add buffer time to each appointment. So if you remember, when you're scheduling in Gazelle, we know how long to make a service appointment by um, the, the client is choosing which services they want. Let's say a, a tuning takes an hour and a half and then a cleaning takes 20 minutes and then you know whatever. So now this, this appointment is an hour and, and 50 minute long. That's what Gazelle would then look for an hour and 50 minute time slot for that. Um, but you can optionally add a buffer time to every appointment. Um, this is great for um, if you just don't want it to be packed so tightly. Uh, we mentioned this is great for making sure you have breaks in the day. Um, if you need you know, take lunch or things like that, just this will help spread things out a little bit so it's not so packed together. Um, or um, you want to have time to socialize with clients. You know, it's not all just business. You want to take time to chat with them. Then you might want to offer, add a little bit of a buffer time to each of these. So we usually recommend five or 10 minutes to each appointment. Um, this is actually also really useful if you're just getting started um, as a technician and not um, terribly confident in how fast you can do a, a tuning. You're not uh, terribly regular in how, how uh, fast you can do them. You could just add a big buffer time to all of your appointments to give you plenty of, of time between appointments so that if something goes over time, you still have plenty of time. Um, and then as you get more regular and more um, uh, as time goes on, you can adjust that down. All right, moving on, we've got this option, which is the client self scheduled maximum drive time policy. That's a that's a mouthful. Um, in general, Gazelle is going to do a very good job of making sure that we're not bouncing you all across the county. Um, but there could be a case if a client wants to schedule and your, your um, calendar is really full and there is just nowhere else to offer, it is possible that Gazelle could offer something with like a 45 minute drive time between appointments. Um, if there's, you know, again, that would really only happen if there's no other drive time available, no other option. You can override that in here for customers scheduling their own appointments. And you could say, no matter what, never let a client schedule their own appointment if it's more than 20 minute drive from another appointment on my calendar. Now, again, this does not take into account open days. Um, open days will always be offered to customers. Um, but this is just, um, if you already have an anchor point on a calendar for an appointment on a calendar um, on a day, then this will make sure that clients can't schedule anything more than 20 minute drive time away from those. Um, we usually recommend that you keep this pretty high because Gazelle does, does do a very good job of optimizing your routes for you. And again, the only, really the only reason that it would offer that option to a customer is if there wasn't anything else. And so if you set this too low, you might actually be losing appointments. Customers might come online and see that there's, you don't have availability. So you don't want to set this too low. Um, so this is probably... Um, this is 20 minutes actually is pretty low here. We would, I would usually recommend keeping us at 30 to 40 minutes um, if you do want to set something or set it really high if you are really confident that Gazelle is um, going to do um, to tightly book your appointments for you. Um, yep, go ahead. Do we have a question? Uh, we, yeah, we had a question about the buffer time real quick. Sure. Um, clients see the duration of the appointment when they're confirming. Do they see the buffer time added to the appointment duration? Um, um, I believe the answer to that is yes, because the duration yes. is added at the time the appointment is created. Yeah, so, they won't see that it's a buffer time, um, but yeah. they will just see that this is a two and a half hour time slot um, that we that we booked for you. Yep. Yep. That's all. Yep. Um, traffic policy. This is, uh, so as I mentioned, we do have, um, uh, Gazelle by default takes into account drive times and the way we t calculate drive times is uh, it, it's statistical. It's, uh, it's based on history. Um, but 
in general, we know on Mondays at 8 a.m., the drive time in on this road is going to be, you know, there's going to be a backup on this road. And so we add you know, certain drive times to that. Um, uh, so this is turned on and more often than not, there's no reason to not turn this on. This is a really good thing in most cases. Um, if for whatever reason uh, you, you don't want to take traffic into account, um, then you can come in here and turn this off. Um, but um, there's really not many use cases that you would want to turn this off. Um, if in, in the worst case scenario, if our mapping provider doesn't have good traffic data for your location, it's effectively off anyway. Um, but um, so there's really no reason to come in here and manually turn this off, but it's here if you really want to. <laughs> if you don't trust the drive times, I guess, if you don't trust the traffic predictions. All right. Um, I think perhaps um, you skipped the open day policy stuff. Yeah. You, scrolled, you scrolled down, you did long term, you did short term, but didn't go all did the way to the bottom on the left. Thank you, thank you. I sure enough, I did. Um, let me find this on my notes here. Yep. Um, okay, so the open day policy. This is another one of those that really, unless you have a really good reason, um, you shouldn't change this. Um, but there are some valid cases where you could change this. So this is kind of a, a complicated scenario, um, but let me, let me walk through this to, to explain how this works. So Gazelle in general is going to favor, when, when scheduling, we're going to favor days that you already have appointments on your calendar. So we're going to look and see if we can schedule somebody right next door to somebody that's already scheduled, for example, or maybe a 10 minute drive or a five minute drive. Um, that's, that's what our preference is gonna be. We're, we're gonna do that if, if we are able. Um, and then if, if for whatever reason we're not able, maybe the best option is a 15 or a 20 minute drive from an existing appointment, then we might start looking at days that are open that you don't have anything scheduled. Um, we do that because uh, we assume that you, you probably want to keep an open day. If, if, if uh, it, it's probably better to have two appointments on one day than to have one appointment on two days. Um, just so that you have, you can keep that as an open day, maybe do it as a shop day and not have to worry about going out, something like that. Um, so we've kind of tuned it so that there's a good balance between, between those two of whether or not we, we force it to be on a day that something is already scheduled or whether we force it to be on an open day. Um, but you can tweak that uh, if you want. Um, and you can say that we want to, in, in our waiting algorithm, which we're going to go into probably not tonight, honestly. I don't think we're gonna to get to it, unfortunately. Um, but when we talk about some of the behind the scenes things, um, this is a way that you can kind of reach in and tweak some of our algorithm. So you can say that you don't want to penalize open days at all, which basically means that open days are treated the same as anything else. Um, and this means that is, it, that sounds great in general, but that has implications. That means that if somebody is literally right next door to an existing appointment, um, there is no benefit of scheduling them on that day versus just actually doing an open day where there's nothing, nothing booked at all. Um, and so two days in a row, you might go to this exact same location. So you probably don't want to do this. Um, and it, that's the, the downside of doing that. On the flip side, you could severely penalize open days, meaning that it would take an awful lot for a gazelle to offer an open day before we actually book on a, a, a day that has an appointment. Now, the, the problem there is you might actually be driving 45 minutes or an hour between appointments um, if you do that. Normally, it, you know, if you're up here in, in the moderate, because if it's a 45 minute drive time between appointments on a day that has an existing appointment, we would then, instead of that, we would offer an open day and, um, and kind of optimize your schedule that way. So, as I said, in general, you want to keep this right here, uh, where we recommend right here in the middle. It's kind of a good balance between those two. Um, but if you would rather favor open days or you would rather favor um, keeping all your appointments together, then you can tweak that here. If you do tweak it, I recommend just going up one step and try it out for a month 
and see what Gazelle offers and how that works because even just minor steps in here can have pretty drastic implications to how it affects the, the Gazelle scheduling algorithm. So um, do it in small increments and if it's still not doing what you want, then do the, the severe option. But again, in general, probably don't want to tweak that unless you have a really good reason to do it. Um, it's not something you just want to play with. Um, and if you have a question about a scenario, feel free to email us at support and we could tell you whether um, it's a good idea to tweak that or not. Uh, we do have a question. Um, what about penciling in an appointment or holding it in reserve if nothing else comes up? Like if I have two tunings to accomplish for a dealer within the next two weeks, can Gazelle look for a time and drop that in or is there a better way to think of it? Um, we don't really have a way to, to, to look for an appointment that you could pencil in, um, but you could um, manually do it yourself. What I would recommend in that case is, is over here on the calendar, just book a personal event. Um, so let's just say I want to pencil in this time slot right here and I could just do a personal event and just say, um, pencil in for Bob and save it. Now, of course, the implication there is going to be nobody is going to be able to schedule for that time slot now that that's a personal event. Um, so if you later do know that he's not going to do it, you want to be sure to delete that so that you can open it back up. Um, but, um, but that is a way to kind of block it off. Um, or if you wanted to, you could do it as a memo. If, for example, you wanted to pencil it in, but not block it off of your calendar. You could do it as a memo. And I think, I actually, I don't know if I've, I don't remember if I mentioned this, um, the difference between our three types of appointment, our three types of events. We have appointments, we have personal events, and we have memos. Appointments and personal events block time off of your calendar so that cannot be scheduled. Memos, they appear on your calendar, but they don't actually block time off, so they could still be scheduled. So these are good for things like um, birthday reminders or uh, or like in this case, if you want to pencil something in for somebody, um, but if somebody else wants to schedule for that time slot, um, they still could. So depending on what you want, you could use a memo or a personal event for that. So there's a follow-up to that question saying, how about a courtesy follow-up for a client who has an issue after their regular appointment? Ah, yeah. So that's, that's a very good question. So we do have a feature for that. Um, we call it um, scheduled messages. Um, so when you are, uh, let me go up here to the dashboard. Um, when you're done with, a, when you're finished with an appointment, um, one of the things that you need to do is you need to complete that appointment. So on the mobile app, um, it appears, where's my mobile app? Here we go. Uh, let me go back to the today screen. Um, appointments that you need to complete appear on your today screen right here under uncompleted appointments. Um, and on the website, it appears on your dashboard right here. These are the appointments that you need to complete. So when you go into one of these, um, let me mark this one as complete. One of the things you can do is you can send a follow-up message. Um, let me do it here on the, um, on the mobile app. Uh, shoot, I got lost. We don't have any canners. Yeah, I don't have any canned. We don't have created. Let me, let me do it here. Um, so on the mobile app, let's say I'm completing this appointment, I can click here on send a message and I can uh, schedule an, an email to go out or a text message to go out at a specific time. Um, so I could say, remember, reminder, um, do something. And then I could send it out right now or I could say I want to send this out later. So I could send it, let's say I want to send it next week at 10 p.m and then save and Gazelle will automatically send that out next week at 10 p.m. You don't need to think about it. You don't need to remember to do that. So I think the question was specifically about a follow-up appointment, not a follow-up message. Um, oh. So a courtesy follow-up for a client who has an issue after their regular appointment. So I imagine gotcha. an issue okay. back and visit. Them. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I misunderstood. Yeah, in that case, um, what you would do, uh, let me go over here to the, back to the calendar. Um, in that case, what you would do, I would pull in the scheduler. So I'm hitting shift N again. That's that shortcut that you can do shift N to pull in the scheduler. Um, let me find that client. Let's say it's this guy. Um, 
and I can then change what services he wanted to do. So instead of this, this isn't a basic service anymore. This is um, a special uh, fix, let's say a string broke or something. I could put in a, a custom service here and say, this is gonna take me um, 30 minutes and no cost. Uh, I'm gonna do it courtesy like that. So now uh, it's got a 30 minute appointment. I'm gonna start looking for it, okay. Now I can search, again, search the calendar. Let's say this is for Tim, um, for a specific person. So now I'm gonna search for an opening for that person for a 30 minute time slot. It's gonna do that same search um, that we do for all of our appointments um, and tell you when you have availability. Um, so here it looks like, uh, yeah, actually this day, yeah, both of these days look great. It looks like you're gonna be right next door really, uh, that's that little yellow one tucked in right there. Um, so here, let me show you this. If I do shift on this, you can see we've got a cluster of appointments down here and it, it fit that 30 minute time slot in right before them. So, um, so that's a good option. So I could do that, but then the key here is what you wanna do, once I select that, scroll down here and then make sure that you uncheck this. This is a tuning for this piano. Make sure that's unchecked because um, you already did the tuning and remember clicking this is going to reset the tuning reminder for that. So you don't necessarily want to do that. Um, you still want the tuning reminder to go out six months from the original appointment, if that makes sense. So, so now I'm scheduling a 30 minute appointment. I use the scheduler to, to book them in and, um, and then you can click this here. It'll send them an email um, and then hit save. And in a very similar way, you could do that in the mobile app as well. Any other questions? Oh, nope. Um, can I make a, a suggestion here? So it's 9.30 yeah. uh, uh, on the East Coast of the US. Um, we've been going for two hours. There are a couple things that may be useful to folks yet um, mm -hmm. that were on our notes. I think we could probably skip some of the stuff you mentioned about how the algorithm works. But what if we touch quickly on the biasing? Um, because that can uh, impact yeah folks yep. and then also uh, just the best practices just mention those because yeah, I think call. those could be pretty useful good call okay um, so biasing um, yes lose that so in the uh, let's see let me go to the self scheduler here in the self scheduler um, when somebody is typing in an address here um, this will look for the addresses that it provides is based on the location of the, of the web browser. So for example, um, let's say this person is on the south side of your service area. It's gonna by default look for 1295 addresses that are near their locate, where they're actually physically located right now. Um, it does this based on their IP address, um, based on a whole, complex set of algorithms is, is one of the things that our mapping providers do for us. They, they are locating these clients. Um, in some cases, this doesn't work great. Um, in, in most cases, especially in the US and Canada, it actually does work really well. Um, so you don't need to worry about this. Um, in other locations, this doesn't work so great. Um, so if you run into a case where your clients are saying, I'm not able to find my address, it's not popping up in the list, or it's popping up these weird addresses in in on the other side of the world, um, we do have a feature where you can override that and we call it address biasing. Um, so if you go over here to, let me go into settings and I believe it's in your company profile. Yep. And down here on the left, um, here we go. Turn on address autocomplete biasing. And if you turn this on, you can, um, this will now target it towards your company's address. So whatever you have your company address set to up here at the top, um, this is your, your main company address, um, whatever you have that set to, we will then bias those um, search results around that. So you can probably make this like around your service area. So a 60 minute drive around my service area location or my my company address location, those would be the ones that, those would be the addresses that are offered. And that has some implications too, especially if you're a 
a company that has multiple locations um, around the country or around the world even, um, you wouldn't want to do this because this is going to bias those locations only to your company address right here. Um, so that could actually cause more problems than anything. So really, this is a, uh, an option that you, again, one of those that you probably want to leave alone unless you notice a problem. Um, and it's not really something you'll need to tweak. Um, in general, leave this off unless you have a problem um, would be our advice. OK, so while we're on uh, scheduler um, and mapping type questions, uh, before yep. we move to best practices here, yep. uh, we had a question pop up. Uh, how much extra is the scheduler than the basic option without it? Yeah, so um, let me go to pricing. That's a good question. Um, it's 25 bucks extra for the startup plan and 50 for the pro, I believe. Yeah, that's a good way to answer it. <laughs> yeah, so um, if, you, if you don't want it, you can click down here, turn off, and it, it takes 25 bucks off of the startup plan and uh, 50 bucks off of the, the professional plan. Now that will disable all, all scheduling, all routing, um, uh, all of those options. So um, the self-scheduler, I believe, is disabled as well. At that point. So you, um, you would not be able to use the client self-scheduler either with that. Um, the reason is because we need, we need to do routing um, in order to book appointments, to have clients book their own appointments online. Okay, um, so let me move on to best practices real quick. I'm going to breeze through these and I think we'll be done for tonight. Um, we've gone way over time. Um, <clears throat> so we've got five best practices. Um, first, um, make sure all of your addresses are rooftops. Uh, what we mean by this is um, uh, when you're entering addresses into Gazelle, if you're manually entering them for a client, um, you have the ability to just enter a city or a zip code or a, a postal code, um, and you know that that's all you can you can save that and be done and move on. Um, that is, we recommend not doing that as much as possible. You want to get an actual street address that's a physical location of a uh, we call a rooftop. That's what our mapping provider calls it, but um, it's a, a specific location on a map. Um, again, for obvious reasons, if if we don't have that, then we're going to use that default drive time of 30 minutes or 60 minutes when we're scheduling things. And um, you know, while it works, it's, it's not tightly booking your appointments. It's not optimizing your routes as, as good as it could be. Um, so what, what I mean by that is there's a couple places here. If, um, yeah, so if, if in the app you're, um, you're, you're entering an address, in this case, I just entered Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, we actually do pop up a warning that tells you this. We, we let you save it. We don't stop you, but we put up a warning with some of those implications. So if you see that warning, that's what we mean. Um, routing is not going to be as great if you're doing that. Um, and then likewise, we also show it here on the client details page, this little red triangle. That means that we weren't able to find the actual address, a specific rooftop address for this location. So that's an indication that uh, routing for that person is not going to be as accurate. Okay, the second best practice is to use personal use addresses for all of your personal events. We talked on that about how to do that, um, but it is the best practice to do that whenever you can. Um, uh, if you don't do that, we're gonna use the default drive time for all of those personal events. So we have to know uh, when we're scheduling around those, we have to have a, a drive time to and from them. And so if we don't know that, if we don't know the address, we're gonna fall back to the default drive time. So if you know the address, if you can, be sure to put the address in on all of your personal events. We have someone uh, raising their hand with a question. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and um, if you want to go ahead and allow yourself to speak there, you'll need to unmute yourself and you can ask your question. I think it should have popped up a little box that said uh, to ask you for permission to unmute your microphone. Yep. If that was a mistake, um, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Why don't we Why don't we continue? Yep. I'll, I'll move on. Um, so, oh, looks like you unmuted. Uh, would you? Um, are you there? No. Okay. Um, all right. Well, maybe go ahead and type your question in, and um, we can uh, we can answer it that way. 
All right, um, so moving on, um, best practice number three, uh, memos versus personal events. Um, I, I touched on this briefly earlier. Um, memos do not block time off of your calendar, personal events do. So you want to use personal events for um, vacations or um, dental appointments or uh, other things that would, it's basically personal events are a way to block time off of your calendar that's that would normally be available based on your, your availability rules. So it's kind of a way to do, to kind of tweak your availability um, without actually having to customize your service area. So that, that's a great way to do vacations. Just click and drag across a whole week, make a personal event and that whole time slot will be blocked off. Nobody will be able to schedule new appointments. Um, if you make it a memo, um, it just appears on your calendar just so that you can see it, but it actually does not affect scheduling at all. Um, customers can still schedule for those. It's good for birthday reminders, um, reminders to yourself to do something at the beginning of a day, um, something like that. Okay, fourth, um, I, I guess I already mentioned this one, scheduling time off with personal events. Um, so just click and drag on the calendar to schedule, to block time off. Um, and then the start and end of day location, I guess we actually talked about this already as well. Um, when you, you're setting up your service area, you can customize your starting and ending day locations. So um, it's, not if, it's not necessarily a host, you might want to customize that to optimize your routes a little bit better. All right, well, we went way over time. Um, one thing we did skip was, uh, one of the things I was more excited about was the uh, telling you, giving you a, peek, a sneak peek behind the scenes of how um, the Gazelle um, scheduler works. Um, maybe, maybe we go ahead and do it. Um, Nathan, would you be okay if we went ahead and did it so we have it for the recording and um, and then, because I don't think this is enough, it's not enough content for a whole nother webinar. Um, maybe we go ahead and do this for the recording. And um, if you need to drop off, feel completely, feel free to. Um, but I think we're going to go through this. Um, uh, I, I saw a head nod from Nathan. Uh, yeah, sounds good. Okay yep. With that? Okay. yep. So I think we are going to go ahead and do this uh, just for the recording. And so everybody can watch it later if you need to. Um, okay, so let me... We're doing this out of order. Let me jump back up to my slides. This option here, how do we choose time slots? Okay, and let me get us on my notes here. Um, okay. So how do we choose time slots? So this is kind of a, a sneak peek behind the curtain of, of what goes on behind the scenes. So. This is when, when somebody, um, the step before this, when, when you get to this step, um, these are the time slots that are shown to the, the, the client on the self-scheduler. And for you as the technician, these are the time slots that are shown. It's a little bit different, a little bit more detail. Um, but the step before this is that little spinner that spins. And so what's going on behind the scenes when that spinner is spinning? Um, how do we come to this? How do we rank them? That's what we're gonna go through here. So there's really four steps that we go through here. Uh, first is we look at your calendar and we know all the appointments that are already on your calendar and we get a list of all possible time slots for this one particular person that we're trying to schedule right now. So let's say for example, uh, it's Bob on the south side of Charlotte, we're trying to schedule and we know it's a two hour appointment. So we're looking for two hour appointments anywhere on your calendar that would fit. Um, so we get a list of those, let's say it's 150 of them. Um, and then we give each of those time slots a score. Um, well, yeah, so we give them each a score. I'm gonna go into detail on each of these in a minute. Um, so I won't, I won't do that now. We give them a score, we sort them, we sort all of those 150 time slots by the score and we show you the best ones. And that's what you see here. Right here, you're seeing the top six that were scored the highest in our algorithm. Um, that's what you're seeing. Okay, so let me jump into a little bit of detail here. How do we get a list of possible time slots for your availability? So there's four things here. Uh, what, what does availability mean? So when we're looking for availability on your calendar, it means that the time slot is open. That means that um, there is no personal event, there's no other appointment. Um, it's uh, within your availability rules in your service area. Um, so basically it means there's nothing else on the calendar at that time slot. 
Um, second, it means that it's the location is within your service area. So we look at the address of that we're trying to schedule and we make sure that it's within your service area. Um, third, we make sure that there's enough drive time before and after that appointment, um, if there's already existing appointments on your calendar. And then we also make sure that it's within the short-term and long-term limits that you've set in your configuration rules. Um, okay, so that was how we get the list of them. Um, how do we give them a score? Like, how do we actually rank these? Um, so there's three things here. Um, actually, there's a lot more. I'm just talking about the, these are the three main ones. There's a lot of really edge cases that we handle and uh, some special cases. Uh, but in general, there's three things. Um, how far away from the target date is it? Whether this is an open day versus a booked day, a booked day meaning you already have something on the calendar. And then third, um, the drive time from existing appointments. So let me go into these in a little bit more detail. Um, so how far away from the target date? So when a customer is scheduling, one of the things that we ask for is the target date, the, the preferred date. Uh, so on the self-scheduler, it's that calendar that they see, they choose it to time, it's defaulted to the earliest available. Or when you're scheduling as a technician, you see that option, um, earliest available or three months out or six months out. That's what this is choosing, it's choosing the target date. So let's say the target date is October 16th that we chose. We're, we're gonna look for dates before and after that. Um, and we rank them, we give them a score based on how far away from that date it is. So if it is um, like all the way over here, if it's November 20th, that's gonna have a really low score because it's really far away from the target date. But if it's October 17th, that's gonna have a really high score because it's really close to when they wanted the appointment to be scheduled. So that's one factor that we take into account. Next is um, whether it's open day versus a booked day. So what do we mean by this? So an open day, is if you remember those preferred time slots. Um, if it's an open day, we just fill all of those preferred time slots and say these are the four time slots that are available on this day. So in this case, we had 8 a.m., 10 a.m., 1 p.m., and, and 3 p.m. set. And so we would just create four time slots for that day and say these are the four slots available on this day. And those were specified, if you recall, back in the rule sets for your service area. Yep, yep. You can figure that those are the preferred time slots in when you're configuring your service area. If it is, if there's already an appointment on your calendar for a day, so let's say uh, we have an appointment from 11 a.m. to to 12:30 p.m. Um, we look before and after that. Um, sorry, we we look before and after that appointment, um, uh, and we would put like as I mentioned before that we treat this as the anchor point, and now we'll make a time slot before this, and we'll make a time slot after this as being available, assuming that there's nothing else on your calendar. And those would be two time slots that are available on that day. Okay, and then third, we take into account the drive time from existing appointments. So let's go back to that, that use case where we've got 11 a.m. to 12.30 already on the calendar. Um, these two time slots, we, we know that it's a 15 minute drive from this appointment that we're trying to schedule to this appointment that's already on your calendar. So that means we need to back it up 15 minutes and then we know it's a two hour appointment that we're trying to schedule. So in order to do this, we know we need to start at 8.15, or sorry, at 8.45. We'll end it at 10.45. We'll have a 15 minute drive and then we'll get to our next appointment. So that's how we know now we've got a time slot 8.45 to 10.45 a.m. That's one option. But after this appointment was available as well. And so we still know it's a 15 minute drive time between them. And so now we know this one's going to end at 1230. So we start the next one at 1245. And now we're in this case, we've got two time slot options for this day, 845 and 1245. That's how we came to that decision for this particular day. And again, this is a good visualization of where buffer time comes in. If you don't want, if, if this is too hectic and too crowded for you, you'll want to add some buffer time and that will pad these a little bit. Um, to leave a little bit of, of space between them so that you're not um, uh, not booked so tight if you don't want to be. And these will also take into account your preferences too, like whether, you, you know, your start of day, that if you can flip back to the last slide, Luke, yep. um, your start of day, if you wanted to, you know. Uh, That's a good point. Yeah, it, it, it will, if the, that first appointment wouldn't be there, for example, if you um, didn't want 
if you if you had your start of day settings such that it would be filtered out. So yeah, if you had your start of day set at nine a.m., this appointment slot would not have been offered because we would not be able to fit it in to right here. Um, but the second one would. Um, there would still be time for this. Yep. yep, that's that's a good distinction. I think we just got a question. Oh, and I'm not looking. Uh, just popped up. It's not a question. Just saying thanks. So. Oh, okay. Yep. Um, and then finally, so we take all those things into account. We give it a number score um, based on a whole complex set of things. Um, those are three factors. There's a lot more that we take into account. And then we sort them. And so um, after that, we show you the best time slots. So basically what it means is the ones that bubble up to the top are the ones that are close to the target date, that have the, le the least amount of drive time, um, and um, uh, fit into your open days or whether there was a book day um, favorable and, and matches your availability yep. from your from your service areas and your rule sets and your workday configurations yep yeah so th they wouldn't even be considered if, if that wasn't the case yep, yep. so um, if you see something up there um, and, and as you scan down if you if you if you're using gazelle and you you click next to see three six more options and then six more options and you get down to the bottom of the list you're going to see some of the redder options are um, they're either drive times that are larger or they're further out a target date, like maybe they're a month or two away from the target date, and that's why it was scored really low. Um, so um, that's in general how those work. And then again, this is and all that to show this is what you end up seeing after it runs the search is or the client would see these time slots, you would see these time slots. And that is how we come to those conclusions. All right, so that was the behind the scenes. Um, anybody have any questions on, on that, on how that works? If there's anybody left. <laughs> oh, we do there's a handful. Cool. Yep. Cool. No questions, no outstanding questions. All right, well, thank you all for coming. Um, this was our first training webinar. It was, uh, we really enjoyed it. Hopefully it was very helpful to you guys. And we'll be getting a uh, recording of this out um, probably tomorrow. And we'll shoot you guys an email if you want to see it. Yep. And one more thing I might add to, uh, we would very much appreciate feedback on the format of this. Um, we're, we've tossed around lots of ideas for doing user training. And um, so this is kind of our first stab at it. Uh, any feedback you can give us, we'd definitely welcome. And um, we can use that to drive further things down the road. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm seeing some stuff flashing up. Do we have some questions? Um, um, let's see. One is a thanks. Uh, I have people comment on a strange appointment type being generated like 1035 as opposed uh, to 1030 or 1045. Is there a way to choose a default time interval to avoid this and make the appointment uh, times more memorable? Um, no, there's not. Uh, so we do that because we're, again, we're trying to tightly pack your, your appointments. Um, if you could just tell your client, um, you know, if, if you want it to be something more memorable, um, you know, when you're talking to them, just tell them, um, you know, 8.30 instead of 8.35 if you want. Um, but but Gazelle does, we, we book it on five minute intervals. He follows up and says, if Gazelle gives a very specific odd time, the client might expect more exact punctuality from me and complain <laughs> if I show up at 1037 instead of 1035. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a good point. Um, you can yeah. control that in your messaging as well, uh, in your emails that you send out. Um, we usually recommend putting in some kind of text that says, if I'm running late, I'll give you a call. Um, or you can put that in all of your emails that go out. Um, just kind of set the expectation um, to them of, of how you're going to handle if you're running late. Um, so you can kind of handle it through the messaging there. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. And um, uh, thank you for using Gazelle. Um, and have a good night. <laughs>